Hallo und herzlich willkommen zur nächsten Ausgabe von Drink at Home. Das heutige Thema American Beer Testing. Und wie ihr vielleicht seht, habe ich schon ein irrsinniges Grinsen im Gesicht, weil die ersten Minuten jetzt schon mit den zwei Herrschaften irrsinnig lustig waren. Also heute kann ich euch sagen, macht euch bereit für eine super tolle Expertise von zwei wirklichen Spezialisten auf ihrem Gebiet. Aber gleichzeitig auch, glaube ich, wird es etwas für die Lachmuskeln werden. Und ich bin mir sicher, für euch alle zu Hause wird es genauso unterhaltsam wie für mich. Ganz kurz für all diejenigen, die vielleicht noch immer zum ersten Mal dabei sind. Ihr habt diese Verkostungsnotizen. Ihr seht die Reihenfolge der Biere, die wir verkosten. Heute ein toughes Programm, acht Biere. Auf der Rückseite ein paar Worte zu unseren Gästen. Ja, und dann gibt es natürlich diesen Verkostungsbogen, wo ihr euch persönliche Notizen machen könnt. Aber wie schon gesagt, acht Biere, toughes Programm. Wir starten sofort. Welcome, guys. Hello. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> so, I told them already that I'm really pleased, you know, that I get both of you ready for this tasting. And I'm really, really looking forward to the next hours together with you, to the expertise and to your knowledge. And so I would say, Rick, as a guest in Austria, I would say introduce yourself first and then we will continue with Conrad. Okay, beauty before age, as they would say then, I guess. Um, it's really great to be here, guys. And, um, you know, uh, I've said it before, but it's really great that we have found ways to still be together, uh, whereas it is impossible to actually be physically together. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to this evening sampling eight beautiful American beers, telling the stories about the breweries, uh, digging up stories from our mutual past uh, when tasting these uh, breweries before. Uh, it's always been a pleasure for me to come to Austria uh, and be the guest of Marcus and uh, wander the streets of uh, Vienna with uh, Konrad. Uh, really learned to love uh, the Austrian beer culture. Um, and it's, yeah, I can't wait to hop on the train again and make my way over to you guys. Um, a little story about myself. My name is Rick Kempen. I work as beer ambassador. Seriously, that is my title with a company called Beer & Co, uh, an import and distribution company that has uh, specialized itself uh, in the earlier days in bringing American craft beer to Europe. Um, most of those beers will pass the table tonight, or at least the breweries will do. Um, uh, I've worked in various commercial roles, but the last years mainly in uh, uh, the, the role as beer ambassador to educate people about the huge variety of beers, trying to help them discover what they like and why they like certain beers, why they dislike certain other beers. I mean, you can't love them all. Um, and uh, um, finishing off my uh, brief introduction, knowing that we have to do eight beers. Uh, one of the great things uh, uh, of this evening is being reunited with my good friend, good friend Marcus. We share the passion for beer. We share the passion for good food and we share a passion for football. Uh, uh, and particularly, I wanted to show you guys something. This is in what you say, a frame. Uh, it's the original um, um, shirt that um, was worn in Rapid Wien from Max Gröber, uh, um, who um, for a brief period also uh, played for Ajax, my hometown team, which I love dearly. Uh, uh, Marcus was so kind to have it signed for my daughter, an original uh, game shirt that you don't really easily get. Um, uh, it, it's a painful detail that I've actually once watched Ajax play Rapid Vienna uh, in Amsterdam, in the arena. Uh, and we lost, we, we got our arses kicked. 3-1, uh, I suppose. Yeah. Beautiful thing that I remember from that evening was not just the two days preceding the game and spending time with the hardcore fans, but being actually with the Rapid Vienna fans in the stadium of Ajax and seeing the passion and the singing and the, the utter devotion to their team was truly a humbling and at the same time massively entertaining experience. So if tonight is only going to be like 1% as much fun as it was that evening, it's going to be a crashing evening. <laughs> Thank you, Rick, <really. laughs> for these nice words. So, Konrad. Well, uh, hello, my name is Conrad Seidel. Uh, probably most of you has know me because I'm from Austria and, and they're from, most of them will be from Austria. Um, 
the author of Conrad Seidel's Beer Guide. Probably everyone has one at home. And so I'm currently working on the next edition, which is which is quite tough because uh, I can't call someone, hey, oh, what's your opening hours? They don't know when they will open again. So I can't even do any research at the moment. Uh, so it's a good idea to do some online beer tastings. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really fond of, of the theme tonight because... Uh, well, American beer, that um, was, it was eye-opening when I first came uh, to sample American beers in uh, the early 1990s when the craft beer scene was still very, very small. And uh, I had the privilege to meet some of those who uh, started the scene, including Charles Finkel, Charlie Papagian, uh, Ken Grossman from Sierra Nevada, I've been knowing all these guys about 30 years now, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to be part of that scene. And, uh, you know, I travel a lot to the U.S. I haven't been to the U.S. for about a year now, which uh, really makes me thirsty now because, um, well, they, they, they have pretty good beer there. Uh, tonight would be a good day or a good night to, to be in America because um, many brew pubs, many beer bars, uh, which have um, free food tonight, because it's um, when when Super Bowl is on, then they uh, sometimes have a buffet where you can find free food, and they know they sell much more beer when they offer free food, and of course you have to pay for your beer. Um, so there is, uh, sometimes there really is something like a free lunch or free dinner in this case, um, but we're not talking soccer. We're not talking American football tonight. We're talking beer tonight. And uh, let's get serious. And Rick, I think it's it's your turn to uh, to get to the to our first beer because here we in, in Vienna and in German speaking countries, uh, es gibt kein Bier auf Hawaii, but there is some. <laughs> es gibt doch Bier auf Hawaii, Konrad. <laughs> And actually, we will, we will be having our own little Super Bowl. I mean, looking at eight fantastic uh, American brewed craft beers, you can truly call it um, um, a craft beer Super Bowl evening for all of us tonight. Yes. Um, we will be starting off with the uh, Kona, the big wave. And I'm not sure if everyone has already pulled out the beer out of the fridge uh, and has their glasses ready. Uh, I'll just give you an additional second for those of you who are a little bit late. Uh, but it's actually a good thing to, to look at the bottle, as Marcus just did. Um, it's not a can, so you can really only print a very limited amount of information on it, but you can still find some funny details. And um, Conrad, as I know that you are uh, um, a critical reader of um, beer propaganda, uh, uh, you always have to warn people not to immediately trust anything that is written on, uh, on a beer bottle or a, or a can. Uh, but one of the beautiful things and your surprise that you started off with is a great way to introduce this beer. Why on earth would anyone start a brewery on Hawaii? Um, it's, 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 it's an excellent question. And I think it is the exact definition of the huge success the craft beer revolution has in the end of the day played. If you take into account that, like in Europe, uh, the American beer market had like 4,400 breweries in the late 1800s. Um, and for a variety of reasons, the most notable, of course, being um, uh, the prohibition, the, the era in which uh, you could not produce or sell alcohol legally in the United States, followed by the growth of marketing and industrialization in breweries. Uh, that number actually went down to around 70, I believe, in the late 60s of the last century. Uh, and with the rediscovery of flavor and taste in beer that sparked the beer revolution, it meant that really anyone and everyone in the United States was at least uh, triggered by the whole concept. And uh, uh, as far and wide as Alaska, uh, Florida, uh, the state of New England, also Hawaii, uh, the most southeastern tip, if you wish, of the United States, uh, found passionate beer lovers. And uh, um, they introduced beers locally brewed for themselves. 
is going to do what Conrad already did, which is crack open my bottle and um, and pour some beer. It's an interesting thing to note that this beer is probably not brewed on Hawaii. There is actually a Kona brewery uh, on the same uh, uh, island of the of the Hawaii uh, region, but the Kona brewery is part of a larger group of breweries, actually currently co-owned, if not completely owned, uh, by Enhoiser Busch Inbev, the world's largest brewing conglomerate there is. Uh, and they have uh, more production facilities throughout the United States. In our case, it's actually a blessing, I would say, because if you wanted to have a fresh tasting golden ale, which is what it is, uh, and you have to transport it all the way from Hawaii, you lose a lot of time in transportation, which probably will affect the beer in a negative way. So uh, uh, assuming this beer was brewed on the east coast of the United States, uh, it makes transportation time a lot less, meaning that you get a lot better quality beer. And then a golden ale. What is a golden ale? It's obviously, it says what it is. It's an ale, so it's a top fermenting beer. Uh, in the English language, you make a very simple distinction. What we would call pilsners, they will call lager. Uh, mm. And that obviously incorporates also all other bottom fermented beer styles. The English phrase lager simply refers to bottom fermented beer. An ale, in the opposite side, is always a top fermenting beer. So a golden ale, it's actually a pretty young beer style. Um, you could call it the top fermenting brother on speed of lager because it will have the drinkability, the quaffability of uh, uh, a Helles, a Metzen, uh, a lager, but it will have more aromas, more yeast imparted, aromas than a classic lager would have. And that's the ale side of things. Uh, completely clear, mm -hmm. uh, not only the signature of a larger scale brewery, uh, Marcus, your glass is even clearer than mine. <laughs> Mine's uh, not completely clear. Sorry? Yours is not completely? No, it's not completely clear. It's, uh, there's, there's just a hint of haze in there. Uh, which I don't think is bad. And uh, But what I, what I really wanted to, to maybe Rick knows more about it, but if I pick up the aroma, uh, there's there's some, some yeastiness on the aroma, which uh, is, uh, first of all, what is this? Is this Duval? Because Duval has a very similar aroma, uh, although the body of this beer does not match Duval. No, it, I would be I would be shocked if it comes anywhere close to a Duval. Mm -hmm. um, but you you are right. It has uh, it has a pretty yeasty note. At the same time, remarkably estery, uh, uh, slightly fruit like. It's not hugely fruity, uh, which you classically find in top fermenting beers. What I really pick out more than even the the yeasty notes is the classic biscuity malty uh, mm -hmm. uh, aroma. Um, and yeah, I don't have the haze myself. Slight condense. Me yeah, either. It, it is actually, you know, uh, uh, and obviously we've got seven beautiful beers to follow, but this will probably turn out to be, and that's why we start with this beer, the least expressive of them all. It, because in the end of the day, it is meant to be a drinkable, a sessionable, a quaffable beer. Uh, that really should not take too much of your energy to really pick out uh, uh, exquisite little delicate notes of this or that. Mm. It's supposed to be an easy drinking beer, what you would want to have on a warm tropical island that Hawaii in the end of the day is. I completely agree, you know, and it's a really good enter from when you want to get slightly for the first step involved into top fermented beers, from bottom fermented to top fermented, then it's Quite a good beer to step into that kind of new craft beer, top fermented beer. So I couldn't have said it better, Mark, because it's basically like an entry level beer for those who make the first steps on the discovery tour uh, outside your classic uh, uh, Helles and Lager beers. What I also really like when I drink it, uh, and it, and it meets the same um, idea that you've just expressed. It also makes me think a little bit of a classic Belgian blonde Abbey style beer, which mm. uh, is pretty similar in the concept. It should be quaffable. Uh, it should be not too extreme. 
it should be easy going if you wish but at the same time it offers so much more in terms of aroma and flavor than a, a regular lager would do mm. well one thing that um because uh, there was a professor robert weinberg uh, back in the 1990s he was he did a lot of market research on, on especially in, on, in beer uh, in america and in one of his presentations he said something very very interesting where well never thought of that but that seems to be true most american beer drinkers uh don't like the taste of beer <laughs> Uh, and uh, probably that, that holds true for most beer drinkers in the world. They don't like the taste of beer. So this is why some beers, uh, including uh, Budweiser, including uh, Miller Lite, uh, and maybe also MGD, uh, they they're, they're have very, very narrow taste and aroma profiles because they don't want to offend anyone. Mm -hmm. People could get offended if you if you think of, of a of a really bold, uh, interesting lager beer like uh, even uh, a Hellas from Augustina. Uh, people, uh, there's there's this this sulfury note to it. Uh, don't like that. Can can we get it to to less profile? And uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know. As a marketer, people, th those people who, who design the beers are not necessarily the brewmasters. It's sometimes it's the marketers. Hmm. The marketers say, okay, we, we don't want to offend anyone. Uh, we will tell them it's good and people will believe it because they don't find any anything where you could discuss about. Hmm. And frankly speaking, I, I, I really love to discuss beers. But from time to time, uh, I'd like to sit with you folks and... Uh, and enjoy a beer. Well, hey, this is this is a good beer, uh, but mm. but I don't want to talk about this all night. Mm. And so this is uh, this is again one point. I said the, the most exquisite beers, the, the best taste beers that we love. We we've done uh, aged beer tastings together. And, uh, yeah, you would you would do that if you want to concentrate on on on, on beer. But uh, on many occasions you don't really want to get the essence of the beer, but rather have a quaffable drink. I think you made an excellent point there, Conrad, and particularly uh, coming back to the fact that there are so many macro-brewed lagers that have been totally stripped of any flavor, of any aroma, to basically meet the, the biggest common denominator to not offend anyone and to please everyone. Uh, that, that is, again, of course, one of the main reasons why we are doing this evening, uh, because people have rediscovered that such blandness has its advantages if you don't want to think about what you're drinking or eating, but it gets boring in the end of the day. Mm. Uh, whether it's a Budweiser or a Miller Light or a Heineken, for that matter, or a Carling, um, uh, it is really, really, really difficult to tell if you are blindfolded and drinking it out of a black colored glass to distinguish the differences between those beers, they are minute. Mm. And well, you, can, I think you can find uh, Heineken is, is, is different and Budweiser should have its, its signature. But, uh, let's, but you're let's, right. let's, let's not get too many nuances in here, Conrad. It's pretty okay to simply bash Heineken. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, you can do. Point is, you know, and particularly one of the things that I have learned in my years as a Dutch beer uh, uh, salesman, if you wish, uh, visiting Germany and Austria, uh, where lager has always been respected in a much higher way and has been uh, part of the daily culture in a much more pronounced way. Uh, your daily drinks, like you just made the comparison with Augustiner, but the same will go for Stiegel or even uh, Schwechater, uh, have just an average American or just an average Dutch consumer drink those beers, and they will be shocked to the bottom, saying, whoa, this beer actually tastes like something, and I don't want that. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And and there's there's one other thing. Uh, if, you, if you think of the aroma and taste profiles that you find in a standard American lager, or premium lager, uh, like Budweiser, Bud Light, or any of these, then uh, it's pretty obvious that this beer uh, would uh, 
would make a difference. Mm. You would say, okay, this is, uh, there, there, there is more taste in this one. Not necessarily if you're a Schleckata drinker. Uh, in, in, in those countries where, where people are used to drinking beers with a decent flavor profile, in these countries, uh, the craft beer revolution uh, had a much harder stand because uh, there already is so much good beer, uh, and uh, like countries like Italy, where you couldn't get a locally brewed good beer 25 years ago. Well, craft beer scene is booming because all the beers are different and better. Here in this country, craft beers, well, they tend to be different, but not necessarily better because quality of, of your standard lager is, is much better than than in other countries, mm. or at least the, the, the flavor profile is much stronger. I don't want to good or bad, just, just uh, get into, uh, well, let's get to the next beer, because uh, actually the, the, the well, next beer... Can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just briefly stop you there, Conrad, because there is one thing I would like to say to finish off this beer, and then indeed it's definitely time to move on to the next. When, when we said that these beers, these golden ales, uh, are slightly similar in their concept to Belgian Abbey-style blondes, it's an important thing to realize that both golden ale as a concept and Belgian blonde as a concept are still relatively young. They don't exist since the late 70s. I mean, Belgian blonde beer was not a thing, not until Leffe found that uh, when they were exporting beer to France, their blonde colored triple would sell, but their darker colored double beer wouldn't sell simply because the French didn't understand what a dark beer was. So they simply made a double with pale malts and that actually sold. And only since 1976, I believe, we have this style of Belgian blonde ale and golden ale, although it's an English name, it's an American concept. Uh, the English didn't have a golden ale. They didn't need it. They had their bitters, they had their milds, they had their... Uh, pale ales, so who could care less for a rather boring, if you wish, golden ale to that. So however beautiful and simple as this beer is, um, um, you could say that this is the kind of girlfriend that you would love to have during the week, and in the weekend you would like to have a more complex, uh, uh, intellectually more challenging girlfriend than this little golden ale here. But then after the weekend, you're really happy you can return to this simple, pleasant, easygoing blonde. Yeah, I think it's a good Thank idea. Thank you guys. Food-wise, what kind of food you recommend? There were some words about fish, white fish, so not too intense. Well, I guess that is, the, that is the most important thing. You don't want anything too intense to go with this, whether it is an easy fish dish or a, 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 a pretty simple risotto pretty simple pasta dish. Uh, you don't even need meat in it. This is a great beer to pair with vegetarian dishes too. Mm. Get some light vegetables in there with your pasta and cream sauce and you're done as far as I'm concerned. Mm. I agree. Conrad, you want to say something about food? Or you agree also with Rick? Uh, Rick already said that the thing is for ma ma many food pairings uh, fail because you, you get... Uh, too much input from from the beer side, and uh, especially with like fish, as you mentioned, uh, you you have to have delicate beers that have. Uh, we haven't discussed the the, the 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 taste profile of this one, but this gold nail is very low in hops. Mm -hmm. So and, and hops can the some fish they they really get a bad uh, outcome if you if you pair a strongly hopped beer with um, smoked salmon. That can mm. be a metallic uh, mouthfeel, which is which is really not very, very pleasant. So this is this is good for and works with any kind of fish and, and but as as Rick mentioned, it's it's a beer that's non-offending. Mm. Right. I think we, we move on to Sam Adams. Yes. Sam Adams, Boston Lager. Um, well, uh, there's so much to tell about this beer that I, well, I first pour it and then, then we'll see. Uh, the style description says it's an amber lager. 
and um, we're in, in a very light copper node in color wise and so it has a, has a pretty good foam uh, not as much foam as you would expect maybe in a pilsner but uh, foam is white and uh, it, it's it's okay and, and better than than in most uh, American beers that could find at the time when uh, Jim Cook um, introduced uh, Sam Adams Boston Lager. And at the time he did, uh, he uh, had a brewmaster from Germany. And the brewmaster, uh, Walter Scharle, uh, he grew up in Germany. He had worked at, as a brewmaster at Löwenbrau in Munich. And Walter, he said, uh, Jim, let's brew a beer that's um, similar to those beers that we had in Germany in the 1950s. So this lager is um, is more or less a replica of a beer that you could buy 60, 70 years ago in, in Germany just after the war. Because at that time, uh, brewing vessels were uh, picking up more oxygen, which meant darker beers, not the white colored Helles and Pils color. Uh, they used German grown Halata hops, the, the, the one signature hop in this beer. You can smell this one. It's, it's, uh, it's Halata middle fruit. The hop with a, a lot of aroma, not too high in alpha. And uh, I know the hop growers don't like it because uh, in the time when they sold uh, hops by the alpha, uh, acid content at that time they, um, they they didn't earn too much money with that one but still Halatau Mittelfru is uh, is a great hop and it's it's one uh, where Boston Beer Company is I think the largest single buyer of of this hop variety. We get this maltiness and at the same time um, the hops are very present from the very very first sip there's there's this hoppiness in it uh, without being too it's in, in in the background it's 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 just a fair hop layer over the maltiness of this beer mm -hmm. it's a balanced beer in that um, in that respect but it, the balance is set on a rather high level Speaking of those uh, beers we were talking about before, um, of course, it's it's more taste to it, not only to the Kona beer that we had first, but also more taste to it than you would find in a Schweckata, Alta Kringa, Stiegel, or, or whatever, uh, because well, this is a, a beer like in, in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, brewers in Germany, they, they wanted to to have stable beers, stabilizing the aroma. I already talk, talked about the um, brewing vessels that picked up more oxygen. Mm -hmm. but to stabilize the beer, they would add more hops because hop is a preservative. It, 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 it works very well. So in this, in this regard, uh, that beer is um, something that was popular in Germany maybe in the 1950s and uh, was recreated in Boston by uh, Jim Cook. Jim Cook uh, studied in, in Boston and uh, I think at Harvard. And he, uh, he wanted to start a brewery. He, he started home brewing. And then he found out, well, home brewing is boring because they don't make any money with it. Uh, and uh, I think it's always a good thing if you love something, try to make money with it. Uh, this is the American spirit, and Jim did a great job with that. And he, he, in, in the beginning, is well, uh, why, why, why would I, why would I, why would I have a brewery of beer? There's so much overcapacity in the market. Uh, so he started contract brewing his beer, uh, which meant he didn't have a brewery. But there were other brewers that had less capacity. And, and he said, well, um, there's, there's a recipe for, for Boston Lager. Uh, would you brew Boston Lager and um, bottle it for me? 
keg it for me and um, and leave the rest to me. Uh, and then he went to the wholesaler. Said, well, there, there's beer. It's coming from this brewery. Has my label on it. And uh, I'll tell you where to ship it. And the only thing that, that Sam Adams really did was marketing and selling beer uh, to the outlets, which meant getting the best out of the value added chain. Marcus, you know about it. Mm -hmm. uh, selling beer is it's a hard job, but it's, it's also the, uh, the nicest part of the job. If, 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 you, if you're a brewmaster who designs a new beer every day, well, yes, that might be a fulfilling job. But if you're uh, the second hand in the brewery, okay, then you have a boring life. You, you produce the beers that the brewmaster tells you to produce, uh, and it's not fun. And mm -hmm. as an investor, you say, okay, I invested a lot in the brewery, and I have to keep that brewery running. No, you don't have to have a brewery. Just let your beer be brewed by someone else and uh, market it. Just, just make sure that, that it meets your criteria. So what he did, he set up a lab in Boston. And uh, at that time, that was the, the, the first wave of networks uh, in the late 1980s, when uh, big computer networks started, where the World Wide Web was, was not on at the time, but you could uh, connect to a brewery and say, okay, bring the beer you brewed for me to your lab and we will check it and, and see if, 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 you, if you did the right thing. And so uh, then, okay, yeah, this, this batch is okay. That, that might be labeled Sam Adams and uh, we'll tell you where to ship it. This is, this is how the Sam Adams story started. Uh, I'm really happy to, to tell you this. I mean, I, 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 there's more to tell about the brand, but let's, let's focus on the beer first. Huh? <laughs> Now, I was I was in in uh, <laughs> now they have breweries and uh, their own brewery their their um, company headquarters with a decent sized brewery in Boston I was there about a year ago and uh, it's fantastic they 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 brew more than sixty different beers a year there uh, so they they read. Really, very creative, and you know that the range of Sam Adams beers is is, is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also no, interesting, Conrad. If you um, if you look into the history of of um, um, Sam Adams or the Boston Beer Company, if it's officially called, uh, they're not even thirty years old, and they basically tell the story of the recent development in the beer revolution so well, coming out of nowhere recreating a beer style, if you wish, that, again, surprisingly, has way more flavor than the golden ale we just had. And this is a lager, mind you, so much more flavor. But in those less than 30 years, they have actually grown into a company that produces more non-beer than they actually do produce beer. You can probably expand a little bit more on that, but um, they make so many hard sodas and cider-based drinks now that they actually... Uh, I believe the production of, of their beer side is less than 50% of the total production volume. Well, if you, if you include Dogfish Head, then it's a different story. I mean, they, they more or less merge with Dogfish Head. Uh, so this, this means they, they also have a lot of, of, uh, of beer business with, with Dogfish Head. But on the other hand, you're right. I mean, they, they, they were the first to, to go big into hard cider. And they're, they're the only craft brewery that re, uh, promotes hot seltzer. Uh, they're, they're sure they, 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 they know how to make money. Uh, and if you look at the share price, uh, it's, it's going up, up, up. I mean, share price of, of uh, Boston beer was very flat in, in the last three years, but last year it, it tripled. So it's uh, it gives shareholder value and you still get good beer. Uh, what else do you expect? One more? Yes, uh, there, there's more. There's more to it because what they have is uh, they have this 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 lager beer, but they have a great story, a uh, story about Samuel Adams, uh, which is rooted deep in in New England's history, 
And they have, I mean, they have the Boston Stock Ale, which is another great beer. And they have, well, they 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 have their. They also make their crazy stuff like. The and, when they're, and I think some of their beers are really good. Some are just just good marketing. But there's, I was surprised. Uh, Jim Cook, about 20 years ago, he said, we will never do a Sam Adams Light. And about 10 years ago, he introduced Sam Adams Light because uh, light beer is something that people in the U.S. want to drink. And you have, you have to say, uh, for us in Europe, light beer means own alcohol. It's not the same in the U.S. In the U.S., it's, it's not about alcohol. Light means light in carbs and light in, in flavor. Uh, but, uh, but the main thing is and carbs. Uh, people are, you know, the, the Americans, they uh, they eat uh, a double cheeseburger with lots of bacon uh, and a Diet Coke. Uh, <laughs> <In> a refill. <laughs> River refill. <laughs> Just one more little anecdote I would like to throw in into the uh, Sam Adams story. Um, uh, the company I work for also uh, imports and distributes the Wein Stefan beer into the Netherlands, you know, the world's oldest brewery dating back to 1040. And actually, uh, Sam Adams uh, and Wein Stefan uh, were early adapters of the collaboration ID, and they developed a beer together called Infinium, mm -hmm. where both the researchers and the scientists collaborated on pushing a bottom fermenting yeast to its total limits, and they basically created, I think it was in 2010 or 2011, uh, they created this almost champagne-like uh, bottom fermenting uh, beer that reached uh, alcohol heights of 10.5, I believe. And when they did the, 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 the presentation, um, I think it actually was in the, in the Italian Alps, uh, Jim Cook was there, and uh, when the president of the uh, Wein Stefan brewery, uh, Dr. Joseph Schreitler uh, uh, was doing the introduction and was really proud of himself saying, well, we've just reached this year the annual production level of 250,000 hectoliters, uh, which for a brewery almost a thousand years old is, was quite an achievement. And then Jim came onto the stage and said, <laughs> I feel humble. Um, my brewery is not even 25 years old and this year's growth was 250,000 hectoliters. It's, uh, you know, it's one of those crazy little things to take into account if you look back on the massive uh, um, uh, development in, in the beer industry in the, in the last two decades. It's just incredible to see a brewery come out of nowhere and reach production levels, uh, tipping, I think, three and a half million hectoliters now for uh, Sam Adams in total, or maybe even much higher than that. Uh, and then to see classic breweries that have been around for the millennium uh, mm -hmm. basically brew as much beer as that particular brewery spills in a year on the packaging line. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. this, this, this tells you a lot about the market because the market, this, this is how the market works. Uh, if, there, if there's people on the market that we want to buy your beer, uh, and if you do good marketing and tell them, okay, I, I got I got this this Sam Adams beer, um, you know, it's true Bostonian beer, though it's not most of it is not brewed in Boston, but uh, but there's the story. I mean, Samuel Adams, the name Samuel Adams, doesn't mean too much to to people like us, but uh, in America, uh, Samuel Adams, he he was one of the guys who. Um, started the Boston Tea Party, which is uh, which set off the American Revolution. So they say, well, this is a beer right from the American Revolution, although it's not, but the name is. Uh, and uh, if we go uh, in Boston and go to the Quincy Market and, and outside Quincy Market, they, they, they uh, put out a, a brand new brew pub for, for Sam Adams. And outside there is a Sam Adams mm -hmm. statue uh, which is very impressive, and uh, and people know that uh, well, Sam Adams he must have been as important as Paul Revere or or George Washington. Mm. And, uh, what was it? His nephew, John Quincy Adams, uh, who became one of I think second president of the United States. So this is this is deeply rooted in American history, and you know Americans 
they they have little knowledge about history. They, they only they they know some of their own history, but um, when I take Americans on, on tours in Europe, they, they ask me, "Well, is European history all about war?" Yes. What else? <laughs> <laughs> but I've had that for three thousand years, and and uh, only now we have a period of peace and hope it will last for some time. But uh, our, our history is we were fighting like like madmen against one each other. Good so, the then, listen, food-wise, what do you think about spare ribs with a honey sauce on top? Well, fine. Pork knuckles. Every, I mean, this this, this is a hearty beer. This, this demands hearty food. Mm -hmm. So we're, 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 we're talking... Uh, well, as I said, this this the recipe for this beer is rooted in Germany. So German food from Bavaria, from the Black Forest, from uh, from countries uh, where people eat hearty food and drink hearty beer. Well, this this is it. Not so much from the German North, but but uh, well anywhere close to the Alps and to the Black Forest. Well, it's very find the right food. Maybe also something like spätzle with uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, but bring this beer into Gmoa Keller and have one of their great Vienna schnitzels, then uh, I think you'll also have a pretty big smile on your face. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's true. Also, you can go with a goulash or something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, next beer, huh? Yes. Yeah. There's a lot to discuss about the next beer. Yeah, next one is uh, Anchor Steam, uh, and you can see on on your uh, on your little taste sheet if you want to fit it in. It's uh, it says California Common. California Common is a beer style that was not known till five years ago, because for for a pretty long time, uh, Anchor Steam was the only commercial example. It had been around. <laughs> had been around uh, in the late 19th century. But, um, up to the 1960s, uh, as Rick has already told you, uh, most uh, American, most small American brewers had to close. And um, then Fritz Matek took over the, the Anchor Brewery. And he said, well, we, we got a beer here. It's the steam beer, which is really different. It's um, Color-wise, if you compare it to the uh, to the Sam Adams, it's even a hint darker or a little reddish coppery, and um, and you can tell it has a very strange aroma. This aroma uh, is it, at least my bottle is a little oxidized, but you find it in in many many cases that that. There is this this hint of oxidation. There's this this hint of esters, um, and this is because uh, steam beer, uh, California Common, as they now call it, because many brewers uh, copy uh, the the steam beer from Sam from from, from uh, Anchor, and and now they had to find its style. And they say, well, that was that beer was common in uh, in California in the late 19th century. Uh, and they have they have this one problem in in, in uh, California in the Bay Area especially. Uh, the Bay Area is an area where you have um, no seasons. Uh, think of of Austria. You have cold winters, hot summers, and well, sometimes a long autumn. Um, but uh, in uh, in San Francisco, look at the at the temperance scale. The average temperature in San Francisco, January or August, is over 61 or 16 degrees centigrade, which means there's no ice whatsoever. So when Bavarian brewers or German brewers came to San Francisco, uh, they brought their, their yeast strains with them. They found out uh, Sierra Nevada is quite far away in, in times where you have to transport uh, ice with, on, on, on a, on a horse-drawn carriage, so uh, they they couldn't cool their their, their cellars, uh, so they they had to expose the their their 
modern fermenting yeast to higher temperatures, which uh, produces more esters, which can smell here, and, and you can also taste it. Here, it's very rich in aroma, as it warms up in your mouth. It's an explosion of aromas. There is lots of, of malt in this. There's, there's, you can tell that there are roasted malts in there, and you have this profound bitterness behind it. I, I really love this one because um, it's, 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 a, it's a good style. It's a unique style. It's one that uh, uh, can also be brewed by small breweries that have problems in temperature control. Uh, I found it very interesting when we, uh, we tried to find a beer that would be brewed for an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in Munich for the uh, for 500 years of Reinheitsgebot, uh, 1516 uh, and 2016, uh, we, we went to Israel and, and looked for a brewer who would brew a beer that had an Israeli twist to it, would be brewed according to Reinheitsgebot and, um, and would be well, Jewish. And uh, so, so we came up with a, with a California common. Is really a recipe for a California common, which uh, basically is a copy of, of that beer that uh, Fritz Maytag uh, wisely promoted as uh, a typical San Francisco ale because it's 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 ale because it's warm fermented by with the bottom fermenting yeast, uh, so very unique and for a long time um, it was the only California common. True, and you know it's an, it's an interesting addition, maybe that um, the solution the brewers found uh, towards the end of the 19th century um, was to actually use um, science to still have the fermentation happen in the weird circumstances they found them in. And uh, I think all of you have at some stage seen a picture of a cool ship, which you still find in many Belgian breweries. Uh, where they actually, after boiling the wort, they send it to a shallow uh, tank, an open tank, to let the beer or the, the beer in, in pro progress uh, cool uh, on open air. Um, the brewers in San Francisco actually found that if they use that cool ship also to uh, ferment the beer in, then this strange um, um, uh, scientific process happens that the, the yeast, when eating the sugars, uh, producing alcohol and carbon dioxide, that creates uh, a higher temperature and that needs to escape from the liquid. And that actually draws cooler air towards this shallow fermentation tank, which actually kept the temperature just low enough for this fermentation process to actually happen. And that gave it this weird mixture of, um, indeed, a beer brewed with bottom fermenting yeast uh, at ale temperatures, if you wish. And I'm not sure how you view this, Conrad, but I always have this idea, drinking a steam beer or any California common, it also always makes me think of a kulsch, which basically has a similar idea behind it. You use uh, uh, an ale yeast in that uh, stage, in that case, but do it at very low temperatures, at, at lager temperatures you get the same weird mixture of uh, esters and aromas and still the drinkability. Yeah, this is, this is uh, we, many people think of what can we do? I, I got a very new idea, but many ideas have already been in practice for the, the brewers in many parts of the world. Uh, and, uh, and yes, uh, coals or, or, and, uh, and also alt beers, they, 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 they these, these, are, these are beers that are quite unique. And, and if you think an alt beer is an ale, but uh, what was the closest to an alt beer? Um, Fuller's maybe? Fuller's yeah. beers that are, uh, that are not typical for English ale, but, uh, but they, they could be considered more like an alt than an English ale. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's, uh, there's, always, there's always parallels that you find when brewers come up with similar ideas or with uh, with similar technologies, and uh, still we we have not reached a point where we say okay, there's nothing more that can be invented. There's there's always 
uh, new ideas, uh, ingredient-wise, technology-wise. And uh, it's, it's always fascinating to see uh, that there's brewers that stick to their recipe. Yeah. But because this is something that, that also many people don't realize. If you, if you think of um, many of the mainstream lagers, they, they, they keep changing the recipe quite frequently. Uh, they have to adopt to, to customers' um, perception. They have to adopt to, of course, to different qualities in, in the ingredients. And if, you, if you're running a big brand, then you have to have you here close to the, what the customer says. And if the customer thinks that beers are too bitter or not bitter enough, better find a response. Uh, think of, we, we uh, mentioned Budweiser, think of Budweiser. Budweiser uh, is a beer very low in, in, in hop profile and hop bitterness. But uh, if you go to the analysis of Budweiser, uh, maybe 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and nowadays, uh, it, it's different beers. Yeah. Because, uh, maybe 15 years ago, they were at a very low point uh, trying to get um, rid of the bitterness and then they found out, well, a beer without bitterness, that, that doesn't work. So it gradually went up again. That's what you call water, beer without hops. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So guys, <clears throat> food-wise, there are some suggestions. One is telling, you know, sausages with sauerkraut or a black pudding, you know, so Blumsen, that's something I think it's too intense, you know, this Blumsen black pudding mm. can overpower the beer easily. Yeah, I think that would be a little bit too much. Uh, I've actually had the pleasure of uh, uh, drinking this beer in its natural habitat in San Francisco and then have it paired with a clam chowder. Clam chowder or, or uh, smoked fish? Yeah. Mm. That should work very well. Yeah, you don't make your clam chowder every day, but this is definitely a good reason to uh, dig up that recipe and uh, buy yourself a six pack of steam beer and have a great weekend. Yes. One thing that I that I realized when I had many steam beers in San Francisco, uh, I personally had the, the experience that it gives you a headache if you drink too much of it. Yeah. There's many beers where I can drink on and on and on, uh, but no, no problem drinking five liters of uh, Pilsen Oracle or, or whatever, but um, not of this one. This, there, there's really like two bottles. That's enough. Uh, I wouldn't drink more than two bottles of it. From from my personal experience, sure it, but this this could be an effect of the yeast because the yeast produces lots of byproducts, uh, being. Uh, working at, at a higher temperature than it's meant to work at. It produces byproducts that give you this this interesting aroma, but they also could give you a headache. So I, I, I personally tend to be a, a little reluctant in drinking more, so I'd, I'd be happy to move on to the next beer. And it's Rick's turn now. Yeah, we will, we will do that anyway, but I, I guess you make a very important point. It's also very uh, personal. I mean, I've had several occasions where I had definitely more than two bottles of steam beer, and I never had the problem of the headache, but I have it with other beers. Um, and uh, sometimes when you've had one bad experience with any beer, that'll stick to you, and you will, whether it is true or not, will always remember that bad experience with that particular uh, mm -hmm. uh, product. So I'm, I'm, I'm only suggesting that there could also be a psychological effect in play. Mm -hmm. I can remember myself, and it is not limited to, to ales or lagers. I've had it with Stella, uh, but then Stella brewed in the UK. Uh, and that gave me an instant stomach ache. Mm. Let's forget about it. Let's forget about it. The, guys, if you if you have this this ball, remember it's a historic ball. Uh, Anchor just uh, changed the logo, changed their whole design, whole packaging. Uh, so keep the empty ball because uh, next uh, 
delivery of Anchor Steam will have different packaging and you want to remember this this old anchor of the hops and, uh, and, and the barley on it uh, won't be on the on the label in the future. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, and, uh, and anyone who would like to read more about that, uh, it's been uh, big on the internet, many people complaining about this rebranding that will, by the way, not hit Europe, I think, until early May. Uh, but there is an excellent blog post by Pete Brown, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in any case, uh, a brilliant beer writer uh, that he recently published on this um, uh, change of the uh, logo and the whole packaging design of Anchor. Uh, and if anyone wants to uh, read it, we can probably post a link at some stage in the chat somewhere. Uh, but it's a beautiful article with a great reasoning behind it why Anchor, after 125 years, decided to go for a fundamentally different look and feel. I'm and he also gives good examples, you know, what can happen, you know, and why some breweries or some brands change their... Yeah. One thing like. that we could also mention is uh, what I always liked about uh, American breweries and uh, American beers in, in this um, craft beer revolution was just look at the at the labels. Just how many words they can put on a label. They tell a whole story here on the small label, uh, and and they have to put on lots and lots of information uh, for legal reasons. But they 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 also tell you a story. They they give you something to talk about. I think this is this is this is very important um, because uh, our friend Michael Jackson he used to say. Uh, if if the brewmaster thinks it's relevant and puts it on the label, then it is in a way relevant and it tells people, even if they don't understand the whole story that's printed on it, they understand that the brewery cares about it. Mm. Uh, if you look at the bland label where you have a nice anchor on it and it says Anchor Steam from San Francisco, okay, so what? Hmm. But uh, if, if they care to tell a story, they do have a story to tell. Even if, if I don't speak English, well, it doesn't say anything to me. But still, they, they, they have a story to tell. Hmm. Um, if, if, if I yeah. understand hmm. technical terms, hmm. well, then, sorry, you don't understand it, but the brewmaster thinks it's important to... to have the fermentation at a certain temperature. Uh, why do other breweries not tell me about it? Mm -hmm. uh, and and some, some will tell you crap, like cold filtered. Well, who, who does warm filtering? No, but, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, if, if they have a story, put it on a label. I mean, it's, it's for, for people of my age, it's, it's very hard to read because uh, it's, it's very fine print. But um, but I, I guess it's 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 a it's a wonderful idea to give people something to talk about. If, if people talk about beer, then they don't have to talk about crap, and this is uh, this is very important. Well, you are so right. And actually, the new design for the labels of Anchor will actually tell more about the history of the brewery than they even do now on the current uh, uh, labeling. So I'm looking quite forward to that. I guess the best takeaway is that the iconic bottle shape will not change because this particular bottle, which is pretty unique to Anchor, that will still stay around, but it'll have a completely different look and feel. Mm -hmm. And actually, the point you make on um, um, telling stories uh, is a great bridge to the next beer that we will be drinking, this uh, easy IPA from the Flying Dog Brewery. Sorry to interrupt you. So the link is already online. So... If anyone wants to read this great story from Pete Brown, it's already online and can try. I didn't expect anything else of you, Marcus. Beautiful. <laughs> I'll tell you about this beer in a second uh, while I pour my own little um, easy IPA. But, you know, telling stories and using packaging is indeed a great way to show to consumers that you care. Uh, but Flying Dog, uh, which is a bit of a crazy brewery when it comes to marketing, they took it to a whole new level. 
because they actually were the first ones to print at the bottom of your six pack carrier, you know, the little cardboard carrier, um, uh, a little message saying, so you are the kind of beer geek who actually looks at the bottom of a six pack carrier. <laughs> you must be a total geek and, a, and you probably wear Velcro shoes. <laughs> But anyway, we love it. You take your beer so seriously. So, Conrad, you see, there is, you can also really play with, uh, with using that. Uh, and Flying Dog as a brewery, uh, uh, like I said, is a little bit of a naughty, a naughty boy in the class. Um, still also relatively young. I mean, we've just had a beer from um, not the oldest American brewery, because that's Yingling, but definitely one of the oldest American breweries in America, anchor dating back to 1896. Um, uh, Flying Dog Brewery dates back to 1990 only. Uh, uh, actually, Sam Adams is even older than Flying Dog. Uh, but still also in their relatively short history, uh, they have definitely made uh, an impression on the beer world. And uh, particularly uh, with their connection for freedom of speech, and uh, the constitutional right that uh, in America has been under fire in recent years with Mr. Trump uh, to sort of deny uh, freedom of speech or to twist truth your own way. Uh, Flying Dog has always been an advocate to the cause of free speech. And they've actually uh, had one of their beers uh, and beer labels being taken to court in the early days. Um, you will probably see if you look closely at the label uh, that there is somewhere the remark that uh, good people drink good beer. I'm not, I'm not sure if it is on this European label version, but one of their most famous beers inspired by um, um, Dr. Gonzo, Hunter Thompson, the famous uh, American writer and journalist, uh, he actually coined their beer uh, saying it's good beer, no shit. And they had that on the label, and that label was actually denied by the American authorities, saying this language was way too rude and way too vulgar to have the ordinary public be exposed to. So they denied the use of that label. And then Flying Dog took that case to actually to the Supreme Court, saying, but this is literature, this is the words of a writer. Uh, where is freedom of speech? And then actually the Supreme Court allowed the use of saying good beer, no shit, and they still carry it proudly on their Gonzo Imperial Porter. <laughs> Always so many beautiful stories. Back to this beer, an easy IPA. Um, it's basically an American interpretation of a session IPA. Uh, I don't think we have to retell the story of what an IPA is, uh, where it comes from and stuff like that. One thing we know, hop is usually pretty central at this stage. Again, it's a golden colored beer, almost copper color. Um, depending on how your light is, it can actually have a bit of a cidery look, Marcus. Mm -hmm. um, but in the smell, in the smell, you get the hint, the suggestion of tropical fruits. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the background, also some little resinous notes and have the same sensation as if you were walking through. Uh, a, a forest with uh, sparse and dense after just a, a little bit of rainfall it gives you that same uh, resinacy aroma in the in the in the nose hardly any malt elements in the in the aroma but this constant suggestion of fruits and there's obviously no fruits in this beer all of these aromas come straight out of the hops that have been used in brewing this beer For those who have been drinking IPAs a lot recently, this is a timid IPA. Uh, uh, that's one argument you could make. It is actually not a timid IPA at all, uh, but hop and particularly hop bitterness can be a flavor, a sensation that you basically can train yourself for to raise your, your benchmark, if you wish. Uh, I usually tell the story when I tried my first Titan IPA by Grey Divide uh, in Denver, uh, for those days, uh, a pretty intensely hopped IPA, it basically <clears throat> 10 minutes before I could blink with both eyes at the same time again. Um, when I drink it now, it is almost like a lemonade. 
Mm. The beer hasn't changed that much. I'm pretty sure it has changed a little bit, but in terms of bitterness, it hasn't changed. My perception of bitterness has changed, though, and and and, and quite dramatically. Um, this easy drinking uh, uh, IPA was actually especially developed for the European market. Um, not sure if you guys in Austria realize what sort of lucky bastards you are, uh, but bear in mind that in Scandinavia, they have some really weird rules and regulations surrounding alcohol, and particularly uh, in Sweden, they are really very strict uh, uh, in stores. I mean, you can walk into beer lovers and you can choose any kind of beer that you want. You can go into a supermarket in, in Vienna and you have a huge selection of beer, but walk into a supermarket in Sweden and you will only find beer going up to 3.5% ABV. Uh, and all above has to be sold in what they call state monopoly stores, a very limited amount of bottle shops that you can buy your stronger beer in. Uh, Finland and Norway used to have a limit at 4.7. Finland has actually released it a little bit. It's now 5.5. But the point is this beer is exactly 4.7% ABV, which meant we could actually sell it uh, also in the supermarkets in Norway and Finland. And would you believe it when we introduced this beer, I think it was 2013, uh, the Norwegians and the Finns were totally crazy about it. For the very first time, they could have like a very fresh tasting, intense, intense for those days. Uh, mm -hmm. EPA at 4.7%, just in the supermarket. They were just going nuts about it. Mm -hmm. Going to any of those supermarkets now, and the only thing you'll find are fantastic locally brewed IPAs. But these were the beers that really were the torchbearers, if you wish, of the importance of the American beer scene on the whole world beer market. Uh, Conrad mentioned it in his introduction. Um, American beer for a long time has been associated with just bland, fizzy, boring lagers, aromatized tap water, if you wish, at best. Uh, <laughs> uh, and for a long time, American, drinking American beer was uh, uh, what, what Monty Python would use to say in their great uh, gig, you know, Drinking American beer is like having sex in a canoe, <laughs> okay, close to water. Uh, but now, with this huge variety of flavors, uh, which were brought to Europe uh, uh, and helped inspire local brewers to make similar beers, we have now the luxury of enjoying fresh IPAs locally brewed and locally grown. It's fantastic. I get really enthusiastic when I talk about this, uh, uh, this development, and particularly this Flying Dog Brewery, because for me, Next to Anchor, it's definitely a favorite of mine, uh, uh, looking at the variety of beers they make and the high attention they pay to quality. Um, obviously, it is impossible to drink this beer and enjoy it as fresh as you would do at the brewery. There's always the handicap for imported beer out of the United States of America. But even now, drinking this beer that has gone from Frederick in Maryland to Amsterdam, then to Vienna, and then came back to Amsterdam. Pretty impressed to see how uh, how this beer stands up and how <laughs> aromatic and how pleasant it is on the on both the nose and the palate for me. Mm -hmm. Still. Mm -hmm. wise Yes, go ahead, food wise We can we will need some recommendations. But then we have a question coming in about branding, relabeling. Go ahead, Rick. Um, I'm really looking forward also to the suggestions that Conrad will pose, but there are two dishes that I always enjoy hugely with this. Uh, one is the simple pasta alla carbonara, uh, particularly with the cream and the bacon, uh, that really gives enough bite to need a little bit of more counterweight, if you wish, in the harmonious balancing uh, and both the, the relatively mild hop bitterness and obviously the CO2 in the beer. For me, it's always a beautiful beer to take with this pasta carbonara. Mm -hmm. But plain and simple burgers is really, of course, what you want to be uh, throwing this beer at. Yeah, I'm not sure because um, if I think of pasta carbonara, as you mentioned, this is some mild filling dish. Um, you could wash it down with that beer. But I think the beer would lose. Because the beers, uh, uh, it doesn't have that much body, so I'd, I'd be quite reluctant. I'd, I'd, I'd go with veal and and, and uh, um, well, 
not, not too strong tasting meat. Uh, maybe also some 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 like uh, fresh cheese. Think of camembert. Think of um, uh, of, of and, and any feta cheese or something. Where, where, where but none of those uh, those things where you okay. It's it's mouth filling. No, I, I totally see your point, and believe me, uh, again, it is very personal how you how you in, in, interpret the the combination. I've always enjoyed my pasta carbonara with this beer, and uh, uh, I do suggest you 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 try it once. I'll I'll come yes. over if I can, and I'll cook you a pasta carbonara uh, at your home, and I'll bring some bottles of Easy IPA, and we have a great evening together, Conrad. <laughs> we will we will need it down now. Yeah. There are some suggestions. What do you think, guys? Pulled pork, Mexican style food. Is this something which can work, you think? Yes. Well, obviously, yeah, sure. A slightly spicy tacos or, or enchiladas will definitely work as well. Sure. I mean, uh, one thing is, uh, as, as we're talking about any of these spicy foods that have lots of caspicine, cas which is the, the, um, the, 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 the spice and pepper. Um, this, this, of course, works very well with hops, um, but it's, of course, alcohol is a little, so yeah, the, 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 the spicier the food is, the more alcohol you need, and, and this, this beer does not have enough alcohol to go with really spicy food. A slightly spicy food, yes, that would work. Even a goulash, for example. Yeah. So there's a good question coming in from Birgit. And it goes to you both, you know. Is there any rebranding you remember that succeeded, especially or failed big times? Rebranding in, in the beer industry. In the beer industry. We are talking beer tonight. What failed? Uh, Löwenbrein America? Löwenbrein America is, 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 is a... Uh, not only that did they rebrand, they, they, they also decided to have it brewed locally, that failed completely. The story behind it, in the 1960s, uh, Löwenbrau was imported to the United States. And then one of the Löwenbrau managers came to uh, the US and sampled Löwenbrau there, and that had been shipped uh, and was not properly cooled. So the beer showed age. So they said, okay, we have to rebrand it. Well, this is Brewed under license, it was brewed by, by Miller in Milwaukee, and they brewed a perfect Löwenbräu. Uh, I was really tasting like the Löwenbräu from Munich. People didn't drink it because the perception of the American public was mm. that the, the age oxidized taste of Löwenbräu was um, the real Löwenbräu and the Americans can brew, can brew good beer, although they really did a good job in, in replicating uh, Leuvenbro. Well, this, this is one of the stories. But, but of course, if, if we're just talking about um, brands that that, uh, that changed their, their appearance, yes, <laughs> did a lot. I mean, that looks very different from what you saw on the Sam Adams label, but the big portrait of, of uh, who was it? it? Was not Sam Adams. He just said it was Sam Adams, um, uh, and and they uh, they they really changed their whole concept. I mean, this is uh, that was a beer where they said beer revolution on it. You don't, you don't find revolution at the moment here. Uh, so they 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 did some rebranding, and and it's it's a question if you. If you develop a brand, because a, a brand story, as they say, is never completely told. You adapt and uh, bring it into into a new decade, century, whatever. Um, complete change to a brand. Um, well, I can't actually really remember yeah. any brand that has gone through such a massive uh, 180 degree turn that Anchor is proposing now. I mean, the bottle that you were showing of Sam Adams, it has changed, but gradually over the past 25 years. If you look at the, the Heineken bottle, that has changed gradually over the years. Uh, I, I'm not too sure about Austrian brands, but I can imagine that even the Stiegel 
bottle design and label design has changed, albeit really small steps every time. And actually, the link that Marcus posted uh, for you guys to read shows uh, one great picture of the development of uh, the Budweiser uh, label change. All those brands really make baby steps in, in changing it, like, like the beer recipes take baby steps to develop over the years. I can't really remember any rebranding in beer that was so fundamentally wrong and so fundamentally massive as Anchor has just announced mm. that we changed it. I can't remember any one of them. Well, they're reading it a little bit, all of them, they're reading it over the years, you know, but Gabriela is saying that Brugok did kind of a really hard rebranding when they decided two years ago to switch the brand to the brand look, like and feel, which we have today, you know, but it's still nothing you can compare with the change of anchor. Well, there's one thing that, that has changed dramatically is Guinness. Think of Guinness. What, what comes to mind? What's the Guinness slogan? The harp. The harp. No, no the lo that's, that's a logo, but, but what's the slogan? Uh, 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 Guinness is good for you. Oh, yes. How long have they not been using this? Actually, I think for the last 20 years, but that's well, not practical. Years, because they're not allowed to. Yeah. Because in, in the EU, they're not allowed to say that there's oh, benefits in it. <laughs> well, and they had to change that. They had to change. But everyone still in, 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 in your head, they're still ringing Guinness is good for you. But they're not allowed to say that. And they do very clever marketing. They, they, they sell their old uh, advertisements uh, as, well, we're not advertising. It's, we're just, we're just showing our history. Uh, but it, and, and, and Guinness does a lot in trying to, to get away from their traditional image. Uh, the traditional image of Guinness was a beer for those working hard, physically hard, or maybe it's young an mothers. It's an excellent statement, Conrad, but that's really uh, uh, about slogan change. I think what Birgit meant was, uh, how do you change your packaging? How do you change mm -hmm. your design? And where do you find an example that it went so wrong uh, that they had to <clears throat> change it? And I, I really can't think of any example there. Yeah. When it came to packaging-wise, you know, it was a big kind of... Schlitz, Schlitz changed uh, everything from from their from their appearance to the recipe, and and they they disappeared, even though they went back to the old recipe, even they went back to the old marketing. Which one was that? Gone. Blitz. Blitz. The beer that made Milwaukee famous. Right. Yeah. Gone. Because th that was because they were trying to save money, yeah. and they were lying about their product. They were lying when when they wanted to to build a brewery in Mary Merrimack Valley. And they found out Anheuser Busch is building another brewery in Merrimack Valley. They said, "Okay, we, we don't want to sit close to to AB. Uh, we 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 drop our plans." And then they said, uh, "Because the environment conditions in Merrimack Valley are, are are not that good as we thought." And a Anheuser Busch just took all the people from Boston, gave them free bus tickets, took them to Merrimack Valley, showed them just what a Beautiful area it is, and Schlitz, Schlitz is gone. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was, in fact, it was it was the one decision by 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 Bob Elan, but in, the manager at the time. We are talking about which year? When was Schlitz? Oh, that was in the early seventies. Hmm. The early seventies. The only thing I can see, you know, in the last couple of years is when breweries changing packaging. That was kind of a big, big thing for the consumers, you know, but label-wise, rebranding-wise, I also, you know, it's really hard to think that anyone really changed it so dramatically like Enka did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, very, there's very few products we can think of. Uh, there's, there's even outside the beer world, there's, there's very few products where it's like, okay, you're focusing on a completely new consumer group, focusing on a completely different appearance. Yeah, the only like, successful uh, example would be Marlboro. Marlboro was, was a cigarette for women. And then they 
found out, well, let's sell it to cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. look, look at the early stage of, 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 uh, of Marlboro advertising. You, you, you see women in pink. <laughs> Right, um, we're going to Sierra Nevada. Yes. Sierra Nevada is a, is a brewery uh, close to the Sierra Nevada, in fact, in, in Chico, California. We also have a brewery um, on the East Coast now. But, um, yeah, in Nashville. Uh, and the uh, Sierra Nevada was founded by Ken Grossman, who was one of the pioneers of um, of craft brewing, and he he imported this brewery from, which was a used brewery from from Germany. Uh, he he tells the whole story in his book, which is good reading because he he tells the story that he uh, the brew house that was Cronus uh, brew house that was. Uh, shipped from Germany to, to San Francisco, and he had all the, the streets cleared so that he could move that big brew house. And uh, then the customs uh, officer found out that there's a bug somewhere in the packaging of the brew house, and it was uh, afraid that, that the pest could be imported, and it was really, really hard to, uh, to get that brew house. And then he, when I first came to Chico to visit Sierra Nevada, they brewed like about um, 19,000 hectoliters in the early 1990s. Next time I came there, it was 1.9 million hectoliters, which was, uh, I think, in 2003. And last time I was there, it was 4 million. So we, mm -hmm. and, and plus another 2 million in, in, in Asheville. So it's um, they're, they're they're really big and they're still very friendly people. One thing that I like about Sierra Nevada, maybe more than about other breweries, these people they're they're really inspired. They 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 love working there. They mm. they have a uh, they have that spirit, and they invite other brewers to go. Uh, for example, the mash camps. Mm -hmm. well, if, if you look at the beer itself, it's um, dark amber, has a nice foam. Again, a beer that was unusual uh, when it was introduced uh, in the uh, late 1980s. At that time, that beer was so different that they advertised it in San Francisco and people from San Francisco traveled to Chico to to get good beer, because you couldn't buy it in San Francisco at the time. And um, now it's, it's, it's an easy drinking beer. But compared to the easy IPA that we just had, I prefer this one because it has more body. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a very balanced beer. It does not have this um, up forward bitterness. Oh, it's it has the hoppiness in the nose. It has some, yeah, tropical fruits, um, mango, uh, maybe a hint of white pineapple, uh, but but it's not overwhelming. And it has some malt also on the nose, and it has this malty body. So it's a very balanced beer, and you can tell. Uh, this is the reason why this is so successful. This is one of the most successful beers from the American craft beer revolution. Mm. Because, uh, everyone can drink it because of its balance. Absolutely. It's pretty funny, though, that um, um, the success of Sierra Nevada, again, a pretty young brewery, if you wish, uh, as compared to, for example, Anchor. Um, Fritz Maytag, when he revised the brewery and brought it back to life, he always stayed very low key and he never really was a marketeer. Jim Cook was a marketeer more than a brewer. And in the end of the day, Ken Grossman and his team were more marketeers than brewers also. I mean, they were actually pretty good at both, uh, but they really beat the drum, uh, the drum, sorry, uh, and attracted so much more attention to their beer than uh, Anchor did. And it's crazy when you think of it that such a classic as Anchor steam beer has always been so hugely undervalued 
and leaving room for a newcomer like Sam Adam, sorry, um, uh, Sharon Nevada, to take the stage at uh, the pace uh, they did. And I'm not trying to take away anything from this beer. I mean, it's it's a classic. It's a beautiful beer, the Sharon Nevada Pale Ale. It's an icon. Mm. But it's, it's always, it, it makes me always humble to think about the fact that uh, such success in such brief time is actually possible and uh, humbleness may not bring you anywhere. But one thing is, uh, in America, it's always about the new kid on the block. And uh, Ken definitely was the new kid on the block at the time. Uh, and so, uh, well, Ritz Matek uh, was there since the late 1960s, uh, reviving his family brewery. And he, he did a great job, no doubt about this. But uh, <clears throat> And he, he made the, the, the first... Uh, Pale Ale IPA with Liberty Ale, which 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 I will love, which is a very very good beer, but um, but Ken Grossman with Sierra Nevada, he was he was new, he he was uh, he was what people are looking after, and and one thing which which we uh, which we all have to think about in, in in the craft beer scene, craft beer drinkers are not very loyal. Mm. Uh, I mean, they they say, okay, what's um, what, what great beers do you have at Beer Lovers? Wonderful. I mean, you, you see people walking into your shop uh, asking for the new beers. And I say, well, you like that beer last time? Well, <laughs> it was last time. Huh? <laughs> what is new? What is new? And, um, and so this, it, it's, it's very, very hard for craft brewer to build up uh, a, a followership that uh, that builds brand loyalty. Uh, some have have <clears throat> worked on this. I mean, Sam Adams definitely worked on this, but but that was uh, going mainstream. Uh, Sierra Nevada, in in some way, uh, do the trick to avoid being too much mainstream while still being very relevant in in the whole business like yeah. uh, having bigfoot for those who really want to have an extraordinary beer uh, and uh, having the pale ale and some other, or, or, or that goes or things like that for, for people who uh, okay I'll, I'll have some some craft beer but not too crafty please mm. No, I totally agree with you, you know, and, and, and I guess also um, uh, looking at Sierra Nevada, the position it has in the American beer culture, uh, particularly Ken Grossman, he is, of course, like an iconic figure who really took the classic route from being one of the first homebrewers when homebrewing was allowed again in 1978. Uh, for those of you who don't know, but uh, after Prohibition was repealed in 1933, a lot of laws were actually not repealed uh, at the same time. And for example, home brewing was still illegal up until 1978. And uh, as he himself says, jokingly, uh, Jimmy Carter, as a president, the only thing I did that people liked was to actually repeal uh, this ban on home brewing. Uh, but Ken Grossman was one of the first to actually take up that hobby. Um, and uh, if you if you dive on Google in his uh, in his life story, uh, the first brew kits that he worked on, uh, he had to make himself because with home brewing being illegal, you couldn't just go into a store like you can go into beer lovers now and buy yourself a home brew kit. You couldn't do that in Ken's day, so we had to basically glue and weld uh, old milk tanks and other stuff he just found alongside the road together to to build his own rudimentary home brewery and. Uh, develop from there. Uh, he must be a gifted person if you can build a brewery uh, doing 1.5 million hectoliters in 30 years out of nowhere. You have to be a very decently talented son of a bitch, otherwise you can't pull that off. Mm. Uh, iconic figure, iconic beer, iconic brewery. Yes. And it is, you know, and also you're completely right, both of you, you know, that people are coming especially to beer lovers, you know, and are searching for new, new beers. But I think that Sierra Nevada is something like an old time classic, you know, 
the people are coming back for Sierra Nevada, you know, I want something really, really intense, hoppy, hazy, whatever. It should be the newest and the freshest stuff. But then, okay, let's give me also some cans or bottles of Sierra Nevada Pele because it's still something which is really iconic. Yeah, and it's a classic. I mean, uh, yeah. in the Netherlands, we have seen this development too, you know, um, um, going back 10 years in 2000, uh, 2010, we still had to work pretty hard to sell beers like Anchor Steam, to sell Liberty Ale, to sell Flying Dog, to even sell Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Uh, when the appreciation for these beers really took off, the biggest victim were the Belgian classics that we've had for years, like Vesmala Triple or Duvel or Palm or you name them, the Koning. Uh, people were, were not drinking those beers because they were boring and they knew them. And We've, we've had our share of beer tickers and people who only want to drink a beer once and put it on untapped and then move on to the next one. But we've already seen a development that people are also getting a little bit tired of having to try something new every day and also being disappointed too often by beers that sound great, look great, are bloody expensive and are in the end of the day just ending up in your kitchen sink because they are undrinkably bad or undrinkably extreme, the revaluation of those classic Belgian beers uh, has now put them in a massively good selling position in supermarkets. Mm -hmm. And my prediction is that beers like Anchor Steam, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, Samuel Adams, Boston Lager, in 10 years will be at the same level as those classic Belgian beer styles. Uh, your go-to safe beers that you can always trust, you can always come back to and know that you will not be disappointed, that you will always have a decent beer experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, but, but it's a limited number of brands that, that uh, can claim that they will be around. And uh, we've seen many, many traditional brewers in, in Europe disappear uh, or their brands disappear because uh, they, they were not relevant anymore. I mean, uh, if you if you if you want to have a successful brand, you have to stay relevant with your audience, mm. uh, and this is what Sierra Nevada is working very hard on. They they they, they I mean they uh, they do concerts, they do they do lots of things where we think okay, uh, there there are people who are loyal followers of the brand, uh, and of course they drink the beer. But um, but it's there. It, it's a limited number of brands that you can have on your mind. Think of cars. Uh, there there's only four or five different cars you could even think of buying because there's hundreds of different car brands which uh, just don't come to mind. You won't won't ever drive them. And same with uh, with about any product. If if you make it to the top five or top three on the consumer's mind, then you have done a great job. But as there's so many popping up and disappearing, like you, you both remember Pete's Wigdale. Pete's Wigdale was similar concept as Sam Adams and was really successful in the 1990s. Uh, Pete's Rosberg still around, but, but uh, the beer is not. Mm. No, but your point is, it is completely correct, Conrad. And uh, uh, relevance is important, loyalty is important. But if I can draw just this one back to the opinion, <laughs> it doesn't matter if they would play fourth division. I'm not even sure if you have a fourth division in Austria. There will always be loyal fans for Rapid Vienna. That's true. And the same goes, you know, especially when it, we came now to Sierra Nevada, back to Sierra Nevada, because especially this brand is something really special, you know, because they have a huge variety of different beer styles. They have them all, you know, from Belgium to Witt to Porta to Barrel Age. And they're playing around with new styles. So I think they really get this balance, you know, they have these old time classics and they're bringing out constantly new kind of beer styles, you know, which also keep them busy and attractive, especially for the millennials, you know, for the younger ones. They are really searching for it. And then the next point is, it's the price point as well, you know, because yeah. you, know, you can fall with a Sierra Nevada, but you're not spending that amount of money which you compare, for example, when you get something of the newer kids, new kids on the block, you know, especially all these hop-driven breweries. 
So that's something which Sierra made really, really well in the last couple of years. You know, we also had this from Enka. You know, it was this time three, four years ago, ago, years ago, they had this permanently something coming out new, and that also keep them really attractive. You know, also for the newer and for for the beer gigs. But now what we can see, especially from Enka, is Enka, yeah, it's Steam, Liberty, and Porta. And the rest is really hard to find, you know. And so they are losing all these millennials. Yeah. Well, who's doing all these conversations, you know, what this marketing team published, you know? No, we are losing attraction on the shelves because we are not iconic anymore, you know. This label is still something which is more than iconic, you know, because that's unique, more or less, you know. And now they are going into this colorful world and they will be one out of ten. And still, yeah, they have the the ball shape, the ball shape, which still is iconic. But okay, we will see, guys. What do you think? Can we move to the next beer? We haven't discussed food. Oh yes, that's true. Food is something we missed. Thank you, Conrad. That 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 that's something that I would have with a dessert. I, I'd I'd really love to have um, Marilyn marmalade by the chicken. Okay. Marille, Marille, Marille. It's an interesting take. I'm definitely going to try it. Maybe if I can make the pasta carbonara, you can make the dessert and we'll have them both. <laughs> now it's coming spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> yeah. Myself actually thinking oh, of, kinds of um, uh, uh, you know, good sturdy sausages and sauerkraut. That will match better than the easy IP from Flying Talk, you know. I completely agree, you know. When you go for sausages and sauerkraut, this Sierra Nevada Pele will be a better option. The sauerkraut will make this taste uh, a little hoppier than it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, again, uh, looking at uh, at harmony and, uh, and balance um, uh, in an ideal situation, uh, the food brings something out of the beer that you didn't find there or didn't find really intensely uh, and vice versa. The beer should be bringing out something out of the food. Uh, I, I do agree with you. The sauerkraut will make the beer, the beer's hoppiness come out more. But I also believe that the uh, still the rather big maltiness that, that you also find in this pale ale will actually help and bring out the best in the sausages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, oh, we're going to have such great dinner soon, guys. Yeah, hopefully soon. <laughs> we only have to fight the kitchen, but I can open my kitchen. <laughs> so we can like cook here. Yeah, too. we can cook here. And it is maybe also better to have neutral terrain, Marcus. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Right. Are we moving on to the next beer? Then uh, it would be Rick's turn, I think. Yes. Let's do that. And then we're going to bring out a whole different animal. We've had so many great blonde beers. Now we are turning to a nitro stout, guys. And not just any stout, a chai milk stout. Now, the great gig here is already in the opening of the can and then the pouring of the beer you will get a pretty interesting hissy sound and when you pour the beer you have the sensation that you can also maybe have when um, uh, putting out one of those Guinness draft cans uh, that the beer seems to behave as if it has just come out of a tap and it will create an intensely thick dense strong uh, a layer of foam, a head that will last for a That's lifetime. Nice. Look at mine. <laughs> and as always, have to be a master, Conrad. And as always, it is you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So, first of all, what is the gig of this nitro thing? Nitro is an abbreviation for uh, a nitrogen gas. Uh, it's it's a sister, if you wish, for carbon dioxide, uh, a, a gas we always find in beer unless there is something wrong with the packaging or the beer has been left for far too long 
uh, and it's a natural byproduct uh, of yeast. When it changes sugar into alcohol, it also produces carbon dioxide, the bubble in the beer. Uh, but nitrogen is a, a, a closer relation to it, but it's a different gas. And the most important difference and flavor effect that nitrogen does as opposed to CO2, it will not fill you up so quickly. It will create way smaller bubbles and it will give a much softer, a more creamy mouthfeel. And that actually helps, particularly in this darker stout beers, to bring out more and more easily the delicate roasty notes in those dark malt-based brews. Now, this is a chai milk stout. So uh, it sounds a bit like uh, something you, you could be buying in Starbucks as well. Uh, milk stout is a crazy little animal, um, uh, has been around for ages, uh, maybe even two centuries. Uh, Conrad will correct me if I go out of bounds, but I think the concept of sweetening beer and sweetening beer with um, um, uh, milk sugar uh, also as a um, um, staple food, as an extra source of nutrients in your beverage that was already a nutrient in itself, uh, has been around as a concept for very, very long. In Scotland, for example. They did it a lot in Scotland. Correct, yeah. What I, what I wonder is, does this contain tonka beans? I haven't even gone so far as to smell the beer, but let's do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can totally see where, where you're heading at. It has a weird, almost Asian, yes. spicy... Cinnamon, cardamom. Yeah, all of it, all of it. It could easily be your uh, mm -hmm. macchiato. Mm. That's my winter favorite so far, really. Yeah, it's a spices. Hmm. The, the great thing is, um, although there, ha that there have been added a lot of ingredients to this beer to make it even more intense, it stays within the lines. It stays within balance. It is not extremely overpowering. Uh, I'm myself not a big fan of pastry stouts, uh, which I usually find to, to really be too much and too extreme and too in your face and too out of balance if you wish this is although it is a pretty intense combination uh, it is perfectly balanced mm -hmm. and i'm not surprised about this because left hand brewing again uh, it's a relatively young brewery uh, from the state of colorado fort collins just 50 miles north of denver which could be seen as one of the beer capitals in uh, in, in america um, its owner and founder uh, uh, takes a lot of inspiration from international uh, 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 countries. Uh, as, as one of few Americans, he has always traveled a lot, uh, partly because he was in the army, uh, but partly because he has a keen interest in what's happening in other parts of the world. He's married to an Italian woman who, who we actually met uh, while being stationed on Sicily uh, uh, during his army years. Um, but that has helped him to, to open up more towards uh, both the classic history of beer he studied in, in, in Germany, um, um, but also to look for more obscure combinations that you can find in his beers. Um, they were the pioneers for uh, nitro nitrogenated stouts in America. Um, one of the frontrunners also for uh, exporting craft beer to Europe. Uh, Eric Wallace is the name of, the, of this founder and co-owner of Left Hand Brewing. Uh, he's also a very active person within the Brewers Association uh, uh, the, for, you know, this association of the small and independent breweries uh, in America. A vocal person with a keen eye for great combinations. And this, yeah, chai milk stout, it sounds pretty, pretty, um, uh, uh, how do you say, pompous? but it is actually a pretty delicate and surprisingly easy drinkable beer. It's super balanced, you know, it's really easy drinkable. It's round and especially for those days, you know. I mean, uh, if, you, if you 
pick up the smell of frankincense and like like gingerbread. Yeah. Uh, it's gingerbread in a, in a can. Yeah. That's an excellent description. Mm -hmm. And actually, that you also immediately nail. It's, it's a bit early for that, but you immediately nail the, the obvious food pairing here. Anything uh, with hints of chocolate and ginger uh, will be a beautiful combination. This is the kind of beer I would like to have with various desserts, Conrad. Yeah, um, but of course, it also goes well with the fine steak. Think of, uh, think of, of a. Of Maybe wouldn't you wouldn't you be afraid it's a little bit too sweet for that? I mean, a standard stout or an export stout or even a porter, uh, I can definitely see with a steak or any grilled meat. But wouldn't this be too too sweetish and and spicy at the same time? <laughs> well, the, the thing is, uh, I mean, if 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 you, if you just take the plain steak, well, yeah, but but again, there's uh, you could could put a chocolate sauce inside a steak. So you could put that beer uh, aside the sink. Yeah. What you guys are thinking about Indian cuisine? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, I mean, we're, we're now moving to, to higher alcohol degrees. So uh, the spiciness of Indian cuisine could be balanced. With, with, as I said, capsaicin needs some alcohol and, and we, we got it here. So it's... Mm -hmm. But alcohol is only 5.0, yeah. so it's not too high, you know. That's why it also it's still really drinkable, you know. Yeah. And a good question is coming out from Birgit. <clears throat> That's a really good question because it's hard to answer from my side. And I guess, wait, are the spices part of the brew or it's dry spiced? And I think it will be both is happening in this beer, you know, that as a rule, brewers will use spices always during boiling. You yeah. Do hopping, you do, uh, you, you can, of course, put spices uh, uh, and other stuff in the tank. lager tank. Yeah. But particularly with this mix, my hunch would be that this is an old boil spice. Boiled? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will find this out for you and I will let you know. So we're going to write the answer down. That's yeah. That's hard to tell because uh, there's there, there there is some spiciness in there. There's a peppery thing that that's uh, is not destroyed by heat. There's um, ginger, of course, mm -hmm. works only during the boil. But there's like what I said, frankincense. I'm not sure whether it's in there, but th that's what I what I get in 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 the nose. Yeah, and I, I guess, you know, the whole concept of dry whatever-ish is that you really only extract uh, certain elements out of whether it is coffee or hops or spices in the, in the, during the lagering process. I suppose to really get the full effect of spices in this beer, particularly with the ginger, you have to use it in the boil. You can't extract that. Yeah, ginger is not possible. Yeah, it, it, it was, it's like some, some are very volatile. They, they will evaporate during boil. Others will be uh, really uh, like linked to the, to, to, the, to the board and then uh, stay in there during, during fermentation. Some will even disappear during, during uh, the uh, fermentation because the yeast can take out some of the aromas that you put in with lots and lots of effort and then at the end it's, it's not possible to add these spices during the fermentation you know it can but be the lagering come up with the, with the perfect solution we don't know we can only speculate so let's send an email out to uh, to longmont and uh, and Birgit will get her notes back what i find really an interesting point to uh, to discuss too and i'm not sure how you guys like it but you definitely get a whole different mouthfeel in this beer and that is really only caused by the nitrogen, partly by the lactose, but this creamy, mm. soft, non-sparkling, non-gassy effect, which is an integral part of flavor. I mean, you've got your basic flavor, you've got your aromas. Mouthfeel is also such an important element in, in how you uh, um, undergo a beer. Mm. I love it. It's, mm. it's 
beautiful how it seems to massage your tongue and it's, it's like heading into the sauna uh, and then coming out of sauna and being massaged for like half an hour uh, with gentle music in the background. This is such a delight for the mouth, mm. the texture of the beer. Yeah. And also what I really like of uh, this beer is, you know, this aftertaste, this really, this is hint of spiciness, you know, this yeah. really sharpness, you know, you can feel a little bit of this ginger, a little bit of pepper, you know, so it's really, really nice. And still it's balanced, it's smooth, it's soft. So that's really... But it's very long lingering. I mean, yeah, this is what I said, so what it reminds me of Tonka beans. This this is very, very hard to be washed away. I'm, I'm trying to go back to Sierra Nevada to get rid of this aftertaste because yeah. otherwise we won't like the, the next beer. Yeah. I will just take a sip of water if I need that. <laughs> Why would anyone drink water when I mean uh, there uh, I know there's 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 brewing water that's okay, but brewing water gets better when when uh, being brewed and fermented and or decently not. Again, I obviously totally agree with you, Conrad, but uh, I actually enjoy, and that's why I want to rather take a sip of water than another beer, I actually love the complexity and this continuous development of the aftertaste. I don't really want to be losing it until we touch base on the next beer. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, I'm usually not a big fan of stouts, uh, uh, and, and particularly when they start to become slightly sweet whether it's a, a classic milk stout and certainly the pastry stouts that is just not my preferred beer style i i like a dry stout more or a porter if i want to have more residual sugars and sweetness uh, to this dark uh, uh, coffee-like bitterness but this is the kind of beer that i can actually i, I think i could actually finish the can mm -hmm. i already did do you remember <laughs> when we shared <laughs> no really really that was you remember it when we shared room back in Denver, you know, and you were always so kind going down to Starbucks, taking what you take for me every single day. It was a child milk latte, you know, and that was that reminds me completely on this on those days, you know. So it's really no, it nails it down, you know. It's written on it and it completely holds yeah. what it says, you know. And so it was, yeah. I was so happy that we get it down to Austria for the first time this year. Yeah, beautiful. No, really. And again, you know, um, it actually applies to almost all of the breweries we've uh, been sampling beer from so far. Uh, obviously, Anchor is a must visit. Uh, that, that's a classic thing. It's pretty difficult to actually visit Sam Adams Brewery, but Sierra Nevada, whether it's in Chico or uh, Asheville, is definitely worth a visit. So is Flying Dog, but Fort Collins, the whole Denver area. There mm. are so many beautiful breweries there. Mm. You can't uh, visit them all. <laughs> yeah, it's quite difficult. Talking about packaging, before we move to the next beer, because you were telling us, Rick, you know, when we started with Kuna, you said, oh, it's a bottle, and it's really limited when it came to advertisement, storytelling and now we had already two cans so what's what's your opinion on cans well, I love cans in general um particularly for beers with a high aromatic value uh, i believe can is a much superior packaging than bottles are for the simple reason that they are completely um light closed that there is no possibility of any uv light uh, uh, starting negative interactions with uh, hop oils, uh, which basically means that you will keep the aromas much better and much longer uh, in a can than, than in a bottle. Um, but this kind of beer, an, a nitro milk stout, does not necessarily have to come in a can. That can be just as well be packaged in a bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, there are obviously also some other advantages to uh, cans over bottles because they are much lighter. So in terms of transportation, you um, in general spend less energy uh, uh, shipping beer across the globe when using cans rather than bottles. I believe the, the effects on the environmental side 
when it comes to 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 recycling even each other out it's way more cheap to recycle glass uh, because you need less energy less heat to actually do that but then again you can only recycle like 65 percent of glass uh, it loses its strength over time aluminium cans are 99.9 percent recyclable but it takes up a lot more energy to actually recycle them mm. so there are a lot of losses and minuses for both uh, I make it a habit to only buy IPAs in cans, uh, and I don't care when it comes to stouts or porters or any darker beer because that effect on 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 the beer quality itself is less for me. Plus, I also believe that there are some beers that I would probably simply, from a psychological standpoint, wouldn't enjoy when they come in a can. I can't see myself pour a West Mallet triple from a can and enjoy it the same way as I would do from a bottle. Probably if I drink them blindfolded, I wouldn't know the difference. But there is something psychologically that holds me back. I had I had a leather blown from a can uh, just the other day. And I mean, I don't like leather blown at all. But but that was, uh, I mean, that, that really showed what they're doing. Because they, they're just putting more or less alcohol in a can and... Uh, it was it was very disappointing, uh, but the next can uh, gives the answer because it says uh, cans are better. Period. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like an elegant bastard talking. <laughs> <laughs> it says cans are better. Period. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess for this beer they will hold true because this is a rather aromatic beer. It is. I mean, I don't have any experience with aged beer in cans. Because I, I do age some beers, but I, I don't have any any cans older than, than a year or something. But I have bottles that are 30, 40 years old. And, but oh, is, isn't that a beautiful beer? I mean, look at the color. It's um, not very, very dark copper. It has this beautiful head it has is small well, you, you you can tell why it's called arrogant bastard <laughs> there, there, there's pure arrogance in the nose it's snobby and it's there there's there's hops there's raising there's um there's strength i mean this this beer is um 7.2, yeah, but it's, uh, it's stronger than the others, and it's it's definitely uh, a great beer. It was one of the first, uh, if not the first beer that, that um, Stone introduced when they were still in San Marcos, uh, which is north of San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the location was later taken over. It was in a, in a garage. It was like taken over by, by the Lost Abbey. And... Uh, and they, they, they built new, a new brewery, many new breweries, in fact, not all successful. And, uh, but, but this is, this is a, this is a very beautiful beer and it's. It has all the arrogance that they, that they claim to have get on the first sip. There's mold and mold and mold and there's just just a plethora of hot bitterness that hits your palate and stays there. Makes it, although it's very sweet uh, uh, at the beginning, it finishes dry as sand. It's it's just it's just unbelievable drinkable. Though it's very very harsh in its bitterness, and this harsh bitterness makes you thirsty, keeps you thirsty. So you want to drink on and on and on. This is this is um, yeah. This is uh, one of my personal favorites. But it's a deceptive beer indeed. It it makes you uh, long for another zip every time you've just taken one. Uh, but only then you find out that it is indeed a tad stronger than the ones we've had before. So this is the kind of beer that can bring you to your knees without you actually knowing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't mind. I don't mind. 
Well, no, I mean, please do go on, uh, Conrad, talking about that. But it's difficult to, to, to pinpoint exactly what kind of a style this beer is. This is one of those beers for me that almost falls in one category only, and that is its own category. Well, yes, but, um, well, it, of course, there, there, it, it's close to an IPA. It, it, I think at the time, we were not to, when, when, when Arrogant Bastard was introduced, uh, we didn't have the term of double IPAs or imperial IPAs. Uh, that's, for me, that, that's the, 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 the closest style-wise. Yeah. Because uh, you're here in... in on very high hop bitterness. Don't know whether they say just how many IBUs they have. You have lots of mold. You have lots of uh, of alcohol. Uh, it's a warming beer. One thing is you you drink that beer and you get warm mouth feel. Um, definitely a beer that you could drink after dinner. You. Yeah. You could again, you could drink that with venison. Uh, I think uh, also maybe duck would also be good with that. Mm -hmm. yes. um, duck has this this um, these fats, these oils mm -hmm. that, that pair very well with that uh, resiny, uh, hoppy, hoppy uh, note in it, um, and it's. It's just a beautiful beer. It really, it's it's very hard. I mean, I have tried to describe it, but uh, uh, there's uh, I'm in love with it. Yeah. But it's funny, you know. If oh, I'm sorry, arrogant bastard. IPU classified, you know, so they are not telling anyone what kind of IPUs are inside. Yeah, but but I, I, this is well over sixty. Yeah. And, and, and it's 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 very well balanced by the maltiness and the alcohol. So that could go up to 80 and, and, and you wouldn't be able to tell. But it's again interesting, you know, even if you look at the can, you don't really find themselves saying this is a beer style. They don't actually use any reference to to any 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 style. I, I like your idea of being a double IPA. You could also maybe see it as a very light in alcohol, uh, almost American barley wine. It, it has those same uh, uh, ideas around it. Uh, but probably it is, in the end of the day, just a beer in its own kind. And it's funny that you should mention that it is stone-related. It doesn't say. That's what I want to ask you guys, you know, why there's not stone written on it? You st still have the gargle? Yeah. It is the stone gargoyle. Uh, they, they actually made a decision. This beer is such a different animal. Uh, and they are usually, with all the other beers, really very narrow in their style keeping. Uh, um, uh, they were the inventors of West Coast IPA. They've done more in, in that idea to stick pretty close to style and style expectation. This one is a beer in itself. So they, they've seen it as, as a beer on its own and therefore... It is such a standalone product that it should be a standalone brand as well. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, probably if you Google it a little bit more, Greg will be able to say more about it. But I guess in the end of the day, it doesn't really fit in the, the stone portfolio. And therefore, it should better be a beer in its own. Oh, stone family. Yeah, that was the kind of story, you know, because they brewed it and they were thinking about Steve and Greg were saying, okay, no. That doesn't fit to the family, you know. And it was more or less they wanted to get rid of it, and they didn't say, "Okay, uh, it's an arrogant, it's a bastard," you know. And so they built out a whole new story. And then it was also one of the first bombers, which were invented yes. to the supermarket chains, you know, in the states. And then they were, "Oh, guys, what do you want to show us? It doesn't fit into the shelves, you know, because they didn't have the space." for these big bomber bottles, you know? And so Arrogant Bastard were one of the first beers which was ever filled in the bomber bottles. But I have to agree with Conrad, this is probably the beer, uh, one of those beers that I could simply just be an evening happy simply sniffing it. I don't even have to drink it, just sniffing this beer yeah. continues to be such a beautiful complex aroma, uh, roller coaster. It, 
brings out new fruity notes, new raisinous notes. It's just phenomenal. Yeah, and I mean, I had it uh, in in several restaurants in 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 Manhattan where you, you know, bold meat and an arrogant bastard just just perfect. And also, you know, when you read the whole story on the can, that's yeah. quite iconic. You know, it gives you more sex appeal. <laughs> it's something, you know. Yeah, and then uh, coming back to my earlier remark, you can use cans much broader uh, to put information on. Actually, none of the cans we are drinking now make total use of that, but they mm -hmm. do take more. In the end of the day, they, they capture more of the eye and, and more of the uh, of the total beer conception, if you wish. Mm -hmm. I just love cans. Yeah, me too. Yeah, cans are... Cans are good, yeah, good business. I mean, ball uh, doubled, almost doubled their, their, their share value within a year or so. They, they're they're doing a pretty good job. And you know what what I what I like about cans is that they um, and what ball does. Uh, there, there's not as many very small breweries that do packaging in cans. Like, uh, you know, I live here in, in, in the Broad Fabric Green, where we have a small brewery, Brewer House 1050. Well, where, during the first lockdown, that, that's where they started packaging their beer in cans so they could uh, send the beer by mail, uh, yeah. which, is, which is very, very important for a small brewery uh, that has no, no, no one walking by because they're... they're, they're in the middle of a lockdown, uh, so the, the only thing they can do is uh, is put a few cans into a into a box and and ship it uh, to some address where where people want to drink it. Uh, I think this is this is good for it's not good for beer lovers, but it's good for uh, for, for, no, for it's not important what it's good for beer lovers. You know, it's more important that everyone gets hands on proper beers. You know, and the quality must be there. That's the most important thing. You know. Yeah, and I, and I think element is the most important thing. We're not advertising beer lovers, of course we do in some way, but the most important thing is that people getting best quality in their hands. That what that was what Rick was telling, you know, you're buying cans for six, seven, eight euros, and then you're thinking, oh, yeah. how horrible is this beer? So the most important thing is that the quality is inside the packaging. That's the most important thing. Well, what I saw in America that that uh, yeah. here in, in Europe, many people, oh, you can't drink beer from a can. Mm. Uh, uh, there's lots of ideology be behind it that people just don't trust cans. But uh, in the US, they, they call them uh, uh, nano cakes because basically this is this is a very very small cake. Mm -hmm. And if you call it a nano keg, it doesn't doesn't look that bad. <laughs> it's beer from Fass, but I know. <laughs> and it's good, you know what Lefton is writing. You know, it's good to go from the can, like a bow, like in a glass. You know, so it really it depends. You know, in what kind of move you are, in what kind of area. If you're in a hotel, if you're next to a Würstel stand, then of course go and drink it out of a can. You know. And but, I mean, there, what kind of there, are reasons, there are other reasons why uh, not drinking from a can or not drinking from a bottle is, is a good idea. I mean, in the end of the day, you do lose your first aromatic impression because you don't get to smell. Uh, uh, if you are properly trained, of course, if you have the beer in your mouth and you swallow it, then you can still get the aromas from the back of your mouth, but you, you have to lose a little bit of the... Uh, total experience if you drink straight from the bottle or straight from the can and that's one one way to look at it i'm not sure how this is viewed in um, austria but in the netherlands cans have for a very long time been associated with relatively strong uh, relatively cheap beer that you would only buy in discount supermarkets and would usually be consumed by people spending all day in the park drinking loads of it so the, the 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 how do you say the appreciation of 
quality in a can has never been around. Mm -hmm. For us, it has taken quite a while to tell that story to consumers that there are actually loads of benefits quality-wise in, in, mm -hmm. in the whole can concept. Yeah, I think if you drink, uh, we go to a, a restaurant or, or even a craft beer bar and they, uh, they charge you seven euros or whatever for, for a can of Arrogant Bastard. They, they, okay, uh, for seven euros, I, I'd expect it to come from, from, from glassware. Uh, no, uh, no specific reason. Uh, this is why, why I love the concept that, that I found in New York where they say, well, it's, it's a nano cake. Well, then it's cake beer. Uh, and, and as you said, the, here we, we, where we have the widget in this can, uh, again, this is, this is something that you can only have uh, on a cap with mixed gas or in, in a can. So it's, uh, it's good for the quality. I think you know, Rick, that the reason is it depends where you are living. Even if, like in an urban city like Vienna or Amsterdam is, you know, and if it's really hard to carry crates of beer, then it's a smart and a wise decision to buy beer out of cans, you know. But if you live in a countryside and you have your own house with your own garage, you know, you can go on a weekly base buying your beer in the crates, put it in the garage. If it's empty, then you go back. But on the other hand, you know, if you have to carry it up, I don't know, in the second or third floor, then of course for, for a canned beer. And I completely agree that still some people are thinking that especially canned beer is kind of cheap. And you know, if you're homeless, then you're snoring for some cents, you know, pennies to get some money out of this. And then you will go to buy a can. But why people are buying a can? It's simply, especially in Austria, in Germany, it's a different story. But there is no deposit to be paid, you know. So if they go, no, really, you know, if people are going to the supermarket and buy a bottle of Gösser, for example, then they have to put the deposit on it and maybe they don't have this money. Cans, perfect deal. It can be 49 cents, 59 cents, 69 cents, but there's no additional cost, you know, but. There's a chance that will change. I mean, uh, in Germany, they've put deposit on cans uh, pretty quickly uh, actually not so much out of an environmental idea, but more to protect the interest of the larger lager breweries who were really only doing beer in, in uh, deposit bottles. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands, we didn't have any deposit on cans either, but that will change from uh, 2022 onwards. We will have a deposit system for cans as well. And I can guarantee you uh, there will be a deposit on cans in Austria as well, sooner or later. Yes, this is this is yeah. what for sure. Yeah, for sure. This is what what the Austrian politicians say, and uh, I, I, I really don't like it because um, cans. I mean, I, I'm I'm privileged because there's in, in the in the broad fabric where I live, there's also a school, so there's there's one recycling box where you can throw in your your uh, your empty cans. Uh, or plastic bottles. Uh, the thing is, the, I think uh, cans are, are good for consumption at home. They're, they're not that good for maybe if you go mountain hiking. Uh, they're excellent for that. They weigh so much less. No, but the problem is... I water back three cans in my backpack, then three bottles. The bottle is empty. It's empty. And you can put it in a rucksack and, and, and carry it back. Uh, it can never really get empty. There's, there's always a few drops in there. Uh, so people tend to throw it away in the mountains. Not it, my cans. They don't, they don't put it back into, into the backpack because it, there, there's, here, there, there, there's, there's a drop of beer here. Uh, it, it, they're, they're, they're not really empty. And so, so you spoil your whole thing that you have in, in your backpack. Don't do that. I mean, and on the mountains, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to take a bottle up the mountain and, 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 and carry it back. But I'm not happy to carry an empty can. And you can crash the cans, put it in a little plastic package, and then you are safe, you know, because then you're gonna, not going to spoil your backpack. And it's easier to get them cold, you know, if you're on the mountains, you know, and it's a sunny day, you know, and you get this 
bottled beer warm, then it's quite tricky. Of course, you will also manage it to get it cold, but when you get it in a can, put it in a small arm river and it will be cold immediately. But okay, that's kind of my perspective. I should tell you both greetings from Martin from the UK, from Europusa. He's watching us now and he's saying hello to all of us. Awesome. Well, we still, a bit before, before getting into informal talk, uh, we still have to work on one beer. Yes, well, one um, more beer. I think that beer is yours, Rick. Sorry. Uh, is I mean, there any food recommendation when it comes to arrogant pasta? To say that, yeah. Oh, what oh, do we oh. eat with this arrogant bastard, Conrad? Pardon me? What do we eat with the with the arrogant bastard? What are the ducks that you're ready? A duck. Stay oh, yeah, we had this. Yeah, we had this discussion about the duck and all that kind of, you know, really fat, intense. I know, I know. It's it's hard to follow me because I'm talking too much. Yeah, but it's okay. You, know. you were right. We were wrong. But it's similar. <laughs> it's similar. You know, take it from that perspective. You know, compared with a bock, you know, you also can take intense cheese. You know, so it can work. You know, the duck can work, and also some sweetness can work. Not at all. It's actually quite a privilege for Sharon Nevada to feature twice in this uh, Super Bowl extravaganza. Uh, but then again, they do have some awesome brews. And this is, you could almost call it a vintage. Uh, the, the, the beer is, is labeled uh, into the year they brew it. They don't brew it that often. Mm -hmm. That's what they are suggesting. And it pours like, well, it almost pours like motor oil, thick. High viscosity. Um, and it's really black. <laughs> beautifully beige head. Um, and it's an imperial stout. It's, you know, it's one of those beer styles that have been around for a couple of centuries, almost disappeared, and they have re emerged in the last 20 years to become one of the most sought after styles in, uh, in the whole beer community. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, what does imperial stout mean? Well, one of the explanations, because this is typically one of those stories that you have 27 different explanations about, and no one knows exactly which one is right. <laughs> the one that I love most is this one. When Peter the Great, Tsar of Russia, traveled Europe and uh, visited different U European countries, like he learned shipbuilding in the Netherlands, he learned weaving linen in Belgium. I don't actually recall what he learned when he was living in London, but one of the things he did discover there is that he loved the local beer, the porter and the stout. And he wanted those beers uh, um, shipped to his court, his imperial court in, in, in Moscow. Um, St. Petersburg it was. No, unfortunately not, because that city still had to be built and then named after him. It was the port that was... Uh, uh, um, that was in, 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 in the early stages of its development, I think in Peter's time it was still a marshland. But let's forget about that. Um, similarly to the, to the challenge story about India Pale Ale, it was a beer brewed to survive a long ship voyage. It is probably a little bit more nuanced than that, but let's stick to that brilliant explanation. Um, the beer from London traveling to Moscow took a long time to get there, uh, uh, sailing to the Baltic Sea uh, took quite a few weeks and then actually the port of what was going to be St. Petersburg and then travel on an ox cart a thousand kilometers into the mainlands of Moscow. That was a long journey. The beer needed more alcohol, more hops to survive. Plus the court of the Tsar loved high alcohol beverages. And that's why they created this special imperial stout, this imperial porter really intended to reach the imperial court in Moscow. And so you can nowadays find a lot of beer styles with the prefix of imperial. It really only means it's a massively strong version of the original beer. But what do you get if you brew a stout with high alcohol and high hops? You need to balance it out in your malt bill. So you are bound to find way more caramel way more chocolate, uh, uh, cocoa hints, even some coffee notes jumping out of it. 
if you smell it, this is your straight up Americana, no chai latte or caramel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> hey, red eye. But that's only the nose, and it still has it has this really weird um, licorice side. It has a little hint of uh, uh, of smoke, really, in a way. And that's just only smelling it. If you drink this beer, you will probably first note the alcohol burn, and then you will dive deep into the depths, the black abyss of uh, chocolate and, and dry ripe fruits. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's the there's the bitterness from roasted malt. There's the bitterness from 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 roasted barley. There's the bitterness from the hops, and there's lots of sweetness as well. It's, it's amazing. You actually again don't really taste it. It's a ten percent plus beer. Hmm. No, I, I'd say it's nine point something. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what what I want to say is uh, what 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 I what I'm not sure about this beer, like with some Belgian beers, isn't it too young? Wouldn't it be better in a year or two? Because uh, I think it 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 gets more balanced with uh, some time. For sure. There's only one way to find out, uh, uh, Conrad, and that is to actually sell this beer. The thing is, there's this everlasting debate. Do you brew beer to drink as fresh as possible? Or do you accept the fact, which winemakers do, that you sometimes need to give a bottle another 45 years before it's drinkable? Mm. My yeah. personal preference is that beer when it's released by a brewer, it's at its peak. And sure, it can take 30 years of flavor development, but essentially it's degrading flavor. No, not, not, not necessarily. I mean, uh, think of um, Chimay, Chimay Bleu, when you drink it fresh from the brewery, it's, it's not as good as after maybe six or, or 10 months. Uh, I, I, I really believe that some beers will find their balance when they're, when they're for some time in the bottle. And, and I know that the, the brewers don't have the time and not the, the space to store the beer and say, okay, we've put it into the bottle, let's sit it in the cellar for another 10 months. We cannot afford that. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is why they, they put it on the market. I mean, I, I there's, this, there's, this, there's this small Trappist brewery in Austria, Engels Tell, the first brew. You could tell that that would be a great beer if you gave it its time. So I bought some some bottles and uh, said, okay, I'll drink them next year. And they were they were perfect next year. They were not good when when bottle was released. Uh, and and uh, as I had told them uh, to be careful, they and put away some beer and release it only after three years, and then, then it was perfect after three years. It, it's, a, it's an excellent point you make. And, uh, I mean, both of you and I, older men, we know that anything with age is better anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> You'll have to wait a little while for that, you young no, fellow. Oh, I'm already that really kind of age, you know, where it's getting better when it's older. But the, the, the point is, uh, I mean, I'm 62. I don't have the time to age beers for another 40 years because I don't believe that, that God will give me another 40 years. Although, I think well, you have a direct line with him, don't you, as Pops? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I agree, you know, on both sides, you know. So you have to drink it fresh when it comes out. Then normally, if you're really professional, you make some notes and then keep it in your cellar. Because there's also this barrel-aged version of Naval. Mm -hmm. But it's released in a can every year, you know? There's Naval barrel-aged, which is released only in a can. So that maybe gives also an answer, you know, that we have to try to see how beer aged in cans. That can be also something, you know, which we can test. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to come to beer lovers for, for a special tasting. Yes, <laughs> but give us 
I don't know, two or three years that we have some varieties, but because that's also something new for us, you know, and I don't know, maybe it was also new for Sierra Nevada, but last year we get the first time we get Naval barrel aged in cans. Mm -hmm. So we will see, you know. Technically, it shouldn't really be that much of a difference whether you age a beer in a bottle or in a can. Uh, uh, the agree. biggest advantage that bottles have in that aspect is that they eventually are more susceptible to allowing oxygen to come in, uh, thereby um, um, expeding uh, the aging process, particularly the portification process. Mm -hmm. And if they are 100% airtight, should delay that process hugely. So probably the development, the flavor development in cans is less than in bottles. But who knows? Who knows what uh, we haven't discovered yet? That's the point. Food. What kind of food you would recommend to this beer? Vanilla ice cream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be great, but anything with chocolate, uh, anything desserty, as long as it also includes uh, uh, some violin music and a good cigar, works for me. Okay. Yeah, good. That that's a good. It's a good point because this this is a beer where you like to smoke a good cigar. I really do it, but but this this is the beer. I said, like, okay, with that beer, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have a a, a nice Havana cigar. Yeah, that can actually that can work, you know. But there's a good question coming out because we are now talking about aging beer, collecting beers. You know, Birgit is asking what our experience is, how long you can storage beer and how long it will try to convince and take the flavor, you know. The oldest beer I ever had, the oldest beer I ever had was about a hundred years old. It was not exactly a hundred years old. It was just 20 days short of being a hundred years old. Uh, but, you know, I couldn't resist. Uh, that was at the, at the judges dinner of the Brewing International Awards uh, in 2001, I think. It was the um, King's Ale from Bass. And had I not known that it was the King's L, uh, I could have taken it for a good old port wine because it, it had this uh, well, the, the showing age of, of, of an old port. That was, that was the, the main experience that you had. Of course, then you could tell it, it has the complexity of some beers, but, but it was the overlaying aged wine component that you, that you got in that one. The thing is, you really can't give a straight answer to this question. It's always a bit of a gamble, like with uh, great wines that uh, if you sell them for 30 years, they can still turn out to be totally uh, acidity. Uh, uh, some beers that you least expected from uh, can last 40, 50 years and uh, and still give you a great foam head and, and a great flavor experience. The same beer can be rotten after five years. It's, mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an individual thing in terms of packaging, but in a general rule, I've always found that darker beers over 7% age better than blonde beers anyway. Uh, we've, we've recently done a vertical case. That's one of the main rules. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we've recently done a, uh, actually a vertical tasting with uh, the Shime Blue that kind of was just talking about uh, uh, 1994, 1984, 1974, 1964. The 1964 was absolutely rotten. 74 was as if it was fresh. Sorry to interrupt you. Was the reason that it was infected or it got some air picking out or it was oxidized? What was the reason? That was that was it. The um, uh, the cap, the crown cork uh, uh, that had rusted, so it was totally oxidized and it was totally uh, not had any fortification uh, um, values or anything. Mm. It tasted like a dead mouse. Mm. To actually see if I was right, I killed the mouse and then ate it. And yes, it <laughs> because I remember, you know, I had the pleasure, you know, to be invited from 
Conrad's wife and Conrad two years ago before Christmas and you and we also get which I never will forget you know we get a tasting of different kind of beers and we also had some shimé which were also kind of oxidized you know oh yeah and so it was superb you know because we had some Edelweiss some Bock beers from Austria then we get some whatever we got you know it was super nice but I never will forget the taste of this shimé and that's why I asked you you know it was quite oxidized and then it was rid of, you know. No, no, the, the problem the problem with that she made was that the that the that the cork uh, had a defect and you had the corky okay corky notes. Yeah. But I did it. The answer is you know it's quite we had that problem in the in the late seventies, uh early eighties, uh where some beers that they just bought bad cork. Mm. Yeah, that's the problem. So, Birgit, the answer is, you know, it's quite not really experience. You know, we have some already some experience, but try and see where it ends up, you know. But it should be similar to wine, you know, to red wine, you know, keep temperature always on the same level, you know, keep them dark and then it kind of an joining, you know, and you will see where it ends up. Great. I from your opposite. Yeah. Rick made make very good comment on um, uh, one thing that, that we all believe in is, well, if the beer is dark and strong, it will age better than a, a blonde beer. That mm -hmm. is true in many, many cases. On the other hand, I've, I mean, one, of, one of the German beers that I love because they they age so well is the Schützenbach from Ketterer in Hornberg. Uh, I think we also had some samples of that. Uh, and now they call it um, for a stout. But, you know, when they started brewing a stout, okay, an imperial stout at the Black, in the Black Forest 30 years ago, 25 years ago, and they asked me what to do. And I think, well, an imperial stout, uh, and it worked, but he couldn't sell it as imperial stout in Hornberg in the Black Forest. So they called it Schützenbach. Uh, but that beer ages very well for like 15 years. Uh, but after that, it um, sort of falls apart. So you get the, the, the roastiness of the, of, of the black molds. And you get the um, alcoholic warming thing, but these these taste sensations completely go into different directions. And uh, the harmony that you have when you when the beer is like three years, five years, ten years old is completely gone after fifteen or twenty years, which was quite disappointing because I thought. Okay, the older it is, the, the better it will be. Uh, and we, we did a vertical tasting. I think when you were here, we, we did that with the, with the Schützenbach. And surprisingly, uh, the very old samples were not that good. Whereas those that were 15 years old, ooh, they were great. That's true. Yeah. There's just one thing I would like to add maybe for Birgit. Um, one of the beer styles that seems to work also good if not best for aging are smoked beers mm -hmm. because the smoked malt is also a means of additional um, um, you know keeping keeping the product good uh, conservation uh, method if you wish uh, but particularly with um, uh, vertical tastings of Alaskan smoked pork or even the uh, Schlenkela Rauchbock uh, it's amazing how how big the complexity is even within five six years of uh, aging those beers it's phenomenal to they're low in alcohol but particularly the flavor element has a tendency to become more intense after a year then disappear and then come back after a couple of years again and give you a whole new uh, um, um, uh, vista if you wish of what the original flavor was that's my recommendation if you really want to experiment and invest with, with smoked beers for, for lagering and cellaring. Okay. And, and, this, and the smoke also like camouflages uh, and masks some of the off flavors that okay. could 
thing. And one other thing that I would like to add about aging beers, one thing that I really love is aging Berliner Weisse, uh, because I mean, there you go, and the same with Goese. Uh, if if you if you have beers that are very low in the pH, um, well, they cannot turn sour; they're already sour, uh, and they and and the acidity changes over the years so it's it gets milder it's uh, I mean, a 30 40 year old uh, berliner weisse that's really like um, like age champagne and um, maybe if you have the chance to to find a bottle of hochschulweisse it was uh, actually brewed at the VLB in, in Berlin when they still had their, their brewery there. I mean, these these bottles are probably too expensive to buy, but uh, <laughs> really, really the good. question is if you still can find some bottles to buy. Well, actually, the, the good thing is there are some brewers that have some bottles at home. Okay. And, uh, some of some of these brewers are a nice people and okay bring a bottle along when they meet me uh martin from europe is still online with us and he is telling that stiegel they are aging their sonnenkönig one year before ah okay so i just reread this post now that so Martin is aging his bottles of Sonnenkönig, which he is getting before he sells it in the UK. Yeah. So we keep it for one year in the storage place, and then after one year they announce there's a new Sonnenkönig, Sonnenkönig, and then he gonna sell it. So it makes sense, you know, for all of us to keep some bottles left in the warehouse. What Schneiderweisse does, Schneiderweisse uh, bottles some Aventinas. Uh, doesn't label it, but put it into a cellar just outside Kilheim. Been there. I mean, you go in and there's bats flying around. It's 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 really impressive to get into that cellar. And there they have their, their like lots and lots of of, of cases of uh, Aventinas, and then they take out one that's seven years old or something, and ship it to the US, and there it gets wrapped into paper with, with a mm -hmm. on the, 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 the vintage. And this is this is the uh, the luxury beer, luxury version of a Schneider Weiss for the American market. But they're still doing this? They're, they're, they're doing this, sure. Been, been, been but doing still, it. because we get so many offers, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, we get different versions and versions, but now it's getting more and more quiet about this project because we had this kind of project, you know, but mm -hmm. that's why I ask, you know, if you know, if they are still doing it. Uh, well, last time I was to that cellar, that was in 2017 or 18. Okay. But I, but I, but I believe they're still doing it because it's good business and you know, it's it's you know they have the importer in in uh, in America, the Matthias Neidhardt uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, United International. Yeah, I, I think and, and and Matthias he knows he knows his business. Mm -hmm. And and you know you can sell a bottle of Aventinas that's seven years old for thirty forty dollars. Mm -hmm. This this is really high end. Mm. There's another question coming out now, Conrad, <clears throat> because you have such a big seller, you know, and a big selection of HBS. If you had any experience, <laughs> if you had any experience about, is it better to store and age filtered or non-filtered beers? <clears throat> Don't know. Don't know because sometimes you I, I, I age those that I get. Okay. Yeah. Uh, even even those that are filtered will build some depot after some time. Okay. Um, it you shouldn't know, really be making that much of a difference. If you, have, if you have living yeast in a bottle, that would consume molecules of, of oxygen getting in. But I, 
and we don't know how many molecules of oxygen are getting into the bottle. Okay. Well, there's a few, but in the end of the day, there is only very few bottles who have live yeast in it. Most of the unfiltered yeah. beers have basically dead yeast. It's not dead, but it's not active. Mm, anymore, it's not active anymore. It shouldn't really matter whether it's filtered or unfiltered. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 and you you don't uh, put the, the polymer glass anyway, so you no. try to, to slowly decant it and, and, and hope you get some more or less clear beer. Okay. So, gentlemen, we broke the old-time record of beer lovers on the online tastings. <laughs> so we managed to do it. So, but... I already noted this, you know, when we started. So I want to ask everyone who is still online, if there are any more questions coming out, you know, if there are still some questions, then that's now the time to come out with the questions because now the time I have is one coming. question for the two of you. A what? I have one question for both of you. Okay. Because I have snuck off twice to the toilet already, and you guys seem totally unaffected. How do you do that? We are professionals. Oh, we okay. are parents, and so you no, told in the beginning you have. When I was still in school, they said you must have a bladder like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> so no, so it's still manageable. Okay, there are no more questions. So if there maybe is. One sentence of both of you to the Austrian beer consumers, or maybe also to some international beer consumers, then please, now is the time. Well, now is the time to take Say the last sentence, yes. Yeah, now is the time, because we're more or less all in the lockdown, now is the time to take your time to sample good beers, because in, in the near future, everyone will get his vaccine. Everyone will be back to, to normal, back to normal life, uh, to all the stress. But now, take your time and enjoy a good beer now, because this is this is probably the best time in your life to do that. <clears throat> Wise words, excellent words. Uh, I can only add to it just realize what lucky bastards we are that we like beer. It is such an affordable luxury. We've sampled eight beers today that probably if you buy them in a store are maximum three euros a bottle a can. And I continue to be amazed about the fact that for that relatively small amount of money, you buy such phenomenal flavor experiences. And that is one thing I would like to remind everyone. Beer is an affordable luxury Enjoy it moderately, but by God, enjoy it. Thank you. So I want to say thank you to both of you, you know, again, you know, that you really take the time to do this tasting together with us. It's always a pleasure for me, you know, because as you told before, I'm still a kid. So there's plenty of time to go for me, you know, and uh, I'm learning out of every tasting, you know, and it's Kind of, yeah. It really makes me proud and happy that I have this opportunity to do tastings with people like you are, you know, and so thank you again. So, okay. Und ich sage danke an euch zu Hause, dass ihr wieder dabei wart. Kurze Werbung muss ich machen, weil es kommen zwei sehr interessante Tastings. Am 9. Februar haben wir die erste alkoholfreie Bierverkostung. Zu Gast haben wir in Johannes von Brovich in Honso. Viele von euch kennen ihn. Und schon einen Altbekannten ist der Dr. Andreas Urban, mit dem, der gemeinsam mit Johannes und mit mir alkoholfreie Biere verkosten wird. Am 17.02. haben wir den Brauschneider zu Gast. Und dann kommen Schlag auf Schlag einige internationale Verkostungen wo die Daten noch nicht fixiert sind, aber es gibt ein wirklich tolles Programm bis Ende März. In diesem Sinne sage ich danke fürs Zuschauen, danke für eure Treue, danke für euer Vertrauen und ich wünsche euch noch einen schönen Abend. Bis zum nächsten Mal.